Hello everyone, and welcome to Ultimate Fanfiction. So we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto discovered the mock teleportation jutsu. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. In the hidden leaf a massive cliff bore protruded busts of four men each one a Hokage of the village, former and current. On the faces, someone had painted copious obscenities and other forms of nonsense. The beautiful morning sun made the vandalism reflect brighter than it would at any other time of day. A boy dashed across rooftops in his village. His skin was tanned, with odd whisker-like scars running across his cheeks. His black shirt and white shorts were covered in paint, as his short golden hair flowed behind the goggles on his forehead. In pursuit was an angry older boy, just twenty years old, darker of face, though plain, blemished only by a scar running horizontally across the bridge of his nose. The younger boy shouted, I didn't do nothing, Urka sensei, can't prove anything and you can't catch me neither. Uruka, the aforementioned older boy, shouted back, quit screwing around, Naruto. I've told you a thousand times that you gotta stop messing around all the time. Naruto retorted, those damned rocks are public property, ain't they? They belong to the whole village, I'm well within my rights to splash some paint on them. Uruka yelled, just because they're public property doesn't mean you can vandalize them. Even if you could, no one wants to see cusses and genitals on their leaders' faces. Without missing a beat, Naruto yelled back, I don't care if no one wants to see him, I'm gonna paint him anyways. Just then, Aruka sped up, tackling Naruto as he jumped onto another roof. He caught the boy in a belly to back hold. Naruto's flailing arm resistance forced Aruka to begin rolling around until he himself was on the top. As he rose with the unruly boy tightly in his arms, he admonished him. You just admitted that it was you, you moron. Now that he was still, Naruto's hair had taken its regular messy shape, somewhat mopping over his goggles. Aruka grunted, and struggled against Naruto further. Naruto, failing to escape, let his arms go limp as he pouted. Aruka then sighed pensively, gently placing Naruto back on his feet. He guided the boy to turn around and placed his hands on his shoulders, kneeling down to meet Naruto's cerulean eyes at level with a somber expression. It makes the whole thing a lot easier if you confess to this kind of thing, Naruto. It's just a misdemeanor and you're just a kid, so if I can tell the Hokage that you admitted to it and won't do it again, we can spin it around so you don't get scolded too badly. Naruto raised an eyebrow in confusion. What's it matter that I confessed, if you're gonna lie to the old man anyways? Aruka lightly grinned, waving a finger as he chuckled. I'm not gonna lie to the Hokage, I'm just gonna exaggerate a little bit. What? Naruto, the Hokage may not have psychic powers or anything, but he can tell when someone's being blatantly dishonest. I'm not gonna tell him anything that's untrue, I'm just gonna make the truth look favorable for your character. Naruto scowled. Yeah, well, I don't really care about my character. I'll just paint the stupid faces again. No, you won't. What makes you so confident in that? Well, if you help me clean up the monument, and promise not to mess it up again, I'll buy you all the ramen you want for a month. A year. Six months. Naruto smirked. Deal. Hokage's office The current Hokage, the leader of the Hidden Leaf Village, was an old man named Hirazen Serutobi. He was the third man to take the mantle, but he signed up for the job again when his successor passed. He stared blankly at Naruto. The Hokage's faces? Really? He croaked. Couldn't you have at least done it to someone less honorable, or painted something less degrading? Naruto shuffled in his feet. Well it's like Aruka sensei said, old man. I'm sorry and I won't do it again. It was wrong of me to do so. Hirazen Sofal T replied, All right, just go clean it up and be on your way. As the village basked in the glow of the moon, Naruto and Aruka, tired and drenched in sweat, sat in shelter from the cold at the counter in a ramen stand. From behind the counter, a man nearing middle age and his teenage daughter emerged, large bowls chock full of ramen in their hands, which they set in front of their customers. Naruto quickly began to slurp it all down cleaning out his bowl desperately and thoroughly. Aruka asked, Don't you want to savor it a bit, Naruto? Nah. Why? I've had ramen a thousand times already, and it ain't gonna taste any better if I waste my time and let it get cold. Hum. Over the course of the meal, Aruka picked at his ramen, leaving Naruto, who had finished bowl by now, with no stimulation. He eyed his teacher, 
sensing a muddy puddle of thoughts within him. Mustering the strength to speak, Naruto asked, So, what's on your mind, Aruka sensei? Deep in his heart, Naruto groaned at Aruka's initial reaction. That stupid sighing again. What's wrong with him? Did I really do something so bad? It was as if Naruto were watching his own father cry. Deep rooted shame began to grip his heart. Aruka stammered a bit, but eventually was able to properly respond. Naruto, you're a good kid. You know it, I know it, and you know that I know it. Where are you going with this? Your grades in the academy have been getting better, you've been less hostile to strangers, and you've even gotten up to a healthier weight for once. You're not the starving, skinny, delinquent troublemaker you used to be. You're doing great, Naruto. I mean it. The shame in Naruto's heart was lightly covered by a blanket of relief. However, Aruka's tone told him that this wasn't a conversation of mere positive affirmations. Hesitantly, Naruto questioned, but, there's no, but, about it. What you did today hasn't made me think any less of you. I just want to know why you did it. Is this an isolated incident? The shame slowly crept back up in Naruto's chest. His cheeks flushed red, as it was now his turn to stammer before giving a proper response. It's kinda dumb. Regardless, I really want to know, Naruto. Promise ya won't mock me or anything. I swear to God. Alright, fine. I did it because. Am I gonna regret this? Iruka waited for Naruto to answer. Iruka placed an assuring hand on Naruto's back. You can tell me anything, Naruto. You're like a kid brother to me. Brothers confide in each other. Naruto frowned. I don't want to be like a kid brother to ya. I thought you were more like a father or something. Why ya gotta do me like that, don't I mean more to ya? In a moment of realization, Aruka's eyes widened, he squinted and cleared his throat. Naruto, the specific ways that we view each other aren't too important here. What matters is that we care for each other a whole lot. The pertinent issue is that I'm concerned about this. Misbehavior you've engaged in. Whether it's fatherly or brotherly, I just want to be someone you can trust with your feelings. Naruto's expression had turned to one of shock. I never thought anyone would be so honest with me. Does Aruka sensei really like me that much? Aruka awkwardly smiled and noted, Hey, you're spacing out on me. Everything good? Naruto, recognizing his own strange demeanor, shook his head and muttered, Yeah, yeah. Before he continued to explain himself. Anyways, I was gonna tell you that I just it's like. Scorn washed over the boy. I'm just a bitter attention seeker or something, okay. The sour dialogue made Aruka wince, but he gave Naruto space to speak. Before back when I just slacked off and everything, people would notice me. Even if it was to say that I'm an idiot, or if they laughed at something I said, I was just glad that someone acknowledged me, you know. And what about now? Now. I've been doing better in class, and at first it was nice that people would point it out to me even Sakura congratulated me for doing better and I thought she'd never even look my way. But now that it's been a while, the luster's worn off. No one's impressed because now I'm just completely average, and I hate it. I've tried my best to score higher, but I've only ever broken into the top, like, 10th percentile, and now it's the end of the year and all that's left is the academy finals in a couple days. Iruka pondered Naruto's words, taking time to try and absorb them. His distress was palpable, even to Naruto, who began to wonder what Iruka was thinking. He shifted his body back to face his empty bowl as he twiddled his thumbs and gently swung his legs back and forth. Finally, Aruka opened up again. Naruto. I honestly don't know what to say. I wish I could tell you something that would make you feel better, or that I know something you can do to make things better, but I can't. Naruto looked downtrodden, dejected at the thought of Aruka admitting his own helplessness. Aruka continued, yet. I don't know yet. I'll mull it over, I swear I will and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Just keep working on your clone jutsu, okay. Tomorrow's the last baseline, but you just need to get it right the day after tomorrow. Trust me, it's probably the only time you'll ever need to use the jutsu for as long as you live. Naruto collected himself, replying, yeah yeah, sure. Naruto's apartment, nighttime atop a cozy apartment complex was an apartment built for two or three people, though it was currently inhabited by just two. As Naruto entered his place, he announced, Hey, I'm home. To no response. Of course Anko isn't home. Is she ever? Some caretaker she is. Disappointed as usual, Naruto pulled off his goggles, revealing the unkempt form of his hair, 
as misshapen bangs fell over his forehead. Biting his lip, made a beeline for the shower. The next morning after completing his morning ablutions, Naruto left the main bathroom, going straight to the kitchen for breakfast. To his delight, his sometimes annoying purple-haired roommate, as she preferred to be called, was at the table. He greeted, Yo, Anko. Good morning. With an uncharacteristically sweet smile, she responded, Morning, Naruto. I guess you're wondering where I was last night. Making his own way to the table, Naruto noticed that breakfast was a real treat this morning. Veal, veggies, some honey, and a warm glass of milk. Fixing himself a pre-breakfast glass of water, he replied, Not really. I just assumed you were getting your regular fill of man juice or whatever. As Naruto drank his water, Anko scoffed. She jested, I got my fill the night before, actually. She then added, truth be told, I was at work. Remember that promotion I got? Naruto nodded, yeah. As Anko told him, well, I'm gonna be busy for a while setting up the second part of the coming Chunin exams it's my first time, and I'm really excited about it. Naruto grinned. And it's on that account that I eat like a prince this morning. Old man's really gotta promote ya some more. Anko quipped, There's a time and a place for everything. In between bites, a question pinged in Naruto's mind. He furrowed his brow and asked, Hey Anko, how come you can tell me about this? Aren't the Chunin exams really big? Isn't this stuff classified? Anko informed, It kind of is. At the same time, there's a lot of integrity assumed with this position. Like, a lot. That promotion put me in a high place among some of the most elite shinobi in this village. If the Hokage couldn't trust me with this job, he wouldn't have given it to me. Naruto nodded again. Huh. The company I keep. As the boy continued picking and eating his meal, Anko piped up. You're kind of a walking contradiction, you know. What does that mean? It means that half the time you're all, look at me, I'm so apathetic, and the other half you get all emotional and stuff. So what? So, it's kinda weird. You're weird. Anko poked his nose. Naruto pouted. You know, that doesn't even make any sense. Just because I behave differently under different circumstances, doesn't mean I'm a contradictory person. That's like, pseudoscience or something. Yet you continue to prove my point. How? You act like a totally helpless moron, but all that talk about P. Suedo whatever clearly shows that you've got a little bit more going on inside that head of yours. Have you been watching those artsy character study movies again? Yes. Naruto rolled his eyes. That explains it. I'll be sure to ignore you for a while. Anko quickly replied, Hold on, now. We still gotta talk about those shenanigans you pulled yesterday. Naruto scoffed. So that's why she's too talkative today. No we don't. I think we do. What's there to all about? I painted some stupid rocks, and then I cleaned up. Anko frowned. I just want you to open up to me, Naruto. Believe it or not, I really care about you, and it hurts me to see you troubled. Naruto cleared his throat. All due respect, I already poured my heart out to Aruka sensei I'm waiting on what he's gotta say. If he says anything useful at all, Anko sighed. All right. The next day, Hidden Leaf Ninja Academy Naruto showed up to the academy in his usual school-compliant attire a blue t-shirt, a vest, sweatpants, and running sneakers all provided by the Hokage, albeit in a manner deemed obnoxious by his peers. The boy was often mocked for his choice in color, as his vest and pants were almost painfully eye-piercingly orange. But they've gotten used to even this. He looked around at everyone, believing this may be the last time he'd see them all. Kiba Inazuka. Stupid fatherless bastard. I hate him. Shino Abarame. Weird. Never says a word. Ino Yamanaka. Vapid. Insipid. Choji Akamichi. Obese dumbass. His heart melted, though, as he spotted his longtime crush and, over the past half of a year his tutor, lusciously pink-haired Sakura Haruno. Man. I really like her a lot. In Naruto's eyes, the girl was perfect. Every feature and expression just tugged at his love-struck heartstrings further as he approached his chair next to her. She spotted him out the side of her eye and greeted him. Hey there, dork. Hey, Sakura. You ready for the test? Stupid question. She's always ready. Of course I'm ready. When am I not ready? She joked. Anyways, how are you doing with the clone? Naruto sighed. The girl knew what that meant. That bad, huh? I really wish I could help, you know. He's kind of annoying, but I'd hate to see him fail. 
Just then, Aruka walked into the room with his teaching partner, a blue silver haired young man named Mizuki. Mizuki announced, All right, class, we're gonna be doing a preliminary evaluation of your ability to create a visible identical illusionary clone of yourself using your chakra. We'll be doing this in alphabetical order, so just be ready for your name to be called. Naruto, being that his last name was Uzumaki, was always the last one to come up in these situations. Thus, one by one, Naruto watched as every single one of his classmates created visible clones of themselves. Almost the same view each time both hands brought together for the hand sign, a puff of smoke, sometimes colored, and a clone. Some much more visible, others better copies, and as usual, Sakura obtained a perfect score. Naruto felt a certain comfort in just how pink her smoke was. As the tests went on, all of Naruto's classmates eventually successfully made a clone. And so came the part Naruto dreaded, he was the only one left to take this exam, and all eyes were on him. He shuffled his feet to approach the front of the room, his heart racing faster and faster as he reached his spot. Mizuki informed, whenever you're ready, kid. Naruto inhaled deeply, scanning the room. For the first time in months, he'd felt something he had been missing. All my classmates, they're eyeing me up and down. They want to know if I'm gonna be able to make a clone? The very attention that he desired the attention that he craved. A Grinch-like smile overtook Naruto as he reached a definitive conclusion. Might as well savor this for as long as I can. Naruto exhaled, then brought his hands together to form a sign that closely resembled the clone jutsu, and channeled his chakra appropriately for the purpose of emerging in a golden cloud of smoke having disguised himself in the illusion of a naked woman. Most of his peers laughed, but a few groaned including Sakura. Iruka, clearly disappointed, sternly ordered, Come on, Naruto, clone jutsu. Naruto dispelled his illusion and grumbled. Making the same hand sign as before, he created another cloud of smoke. Emerging this time as a spitting image of the Hokage himself. He turned to Iruka and jested, poorly impersonating the octogenarian, All right now, Sonny, you must give Naruto Uzumaki a passing score. This act earned him the same response as his previous mischief. Iruka was not impressed. He rolled his eyes and said, Quit screwing around. We really don't need to waste any more time with your antics. Naruto grumbled, All right, all right. He made the proper hand sign for the clone jutsu, and honestly really tried to channel his chakra properly, only to summon a dilapidated, squirming, blue thing on the ground. If it wasn't for the presence of a head like limb, it couldn't even be determined as being human. Iruka remarked, Tomorrow's your last chance, Naruto. You're the only one who can't do this technique. Get it down by then. Followed by an announcement to the class, class is over. Tomorrow's your final, be prepared. Most of the class rushed out immediately, except for Sakura, who made an awkward attempt to comfort her peer. She put a hand on his shoulder and softly said, I'm sure you'll get it tomorrow, Naruto. Good luck. And walked out of the room giving the boy one final almost pitiful glance before going her way. Even Iruka had promptly left, trusting Mizuki to get his material in order. An act not unnoticed by Naruto. Did I really piss him off that badly? Damn. Intense despair crushed the reactionary boy's heart. I've been such a stupid ass, when Iruka sensei was just trying to help me, but I've wasted his efforts. And Sakura's too. All that work I've done means nothing if I don't even graduate from the academy. What's wrong with me? He felt a larger hand rest in his shoulder. Mizuki enticed, Naruto, it's okay. Let's go get some ramen. Tower in the village, sunset Naruto and Mizuki sat atop a tower, the sun now setting. So, Naruto, you ready for that secret test I told you about? Yeah. Just gotta wait until nightfall to slip in the old man's place unnoticed and steal a secret scroll. I do that, keep it, till midnight and I graduate without needing to demonstrate the clone jutsu, right? Mizuki's mischievous lips curved upwards as he replied, exactly. Hokage's office eager to show the Hokage the plans she was working on, Anko giddily approached his office. Only to discover her boss lying unconscious at his desk. She rushed to his leader as she radioed the security teams to bring medical help. Lord Hokage. What's happened? She checked the Hokage's pulse letting out a sigh of relief as he suddenly began to wake up on his own. Frantically, the Jonin asked, Lord Hokage, are you alright? The Hokage grumbled, rising to sit upright as he wiped his bloody nose. 
Nasally, he answered, I'm perfectly fine, Anko. Just find Naruto. I'm worried about him. Deep in the village forest board, Naruto sat at the base of a tree in a clearing, reading the scroll he had stolen from the Hokage's office against Mizuki's orders. Flying Thunder Technique Inventor, Minato Namikaze. Minimum Chakra Level A5, see Chakra Table for Leveling Guidelines. Warning. This ninja maneuver must not be attempted by any individual with insufficient chakra levels. The Flying Thunder is a specialized chakra traversal technique designed to give the illusion that the user is instantaneously teleporting from one place to another. This technique uses a chakra rubber banding effect to transfer the user's chakra from one location or object to another, by using the chakra to effectively pull the user to the desired point. In addition, the user can bring any object he or she desires, provided the user has enough chakra to account for the extra objects. Instructions User must apply a chakra storage seal onto an object. From this moment on, that seal will become a checkpoint for the user. By focusing the transfer of chakra to this checkpoint, the user will activate the rubber banding effect. Drawbacks. Large amounts of chakra needed to perform any part of this technique. Failed attempts due to insufficient chakra may cause chakra burnout, exhaustion, excessive weight loss through perspiration, temporary mental instability or retardation, momentary heart arrhythmia inflammation, excessive hunger or thirst, temporary loss of vision, hearing, other senses. Extra notes. Chakra capacity below A may be safe if chakra control is beyond a certain category. Further research necessary. Naruto's interest was piqued. Of all the scrolls he could have grabbed, he ended up with one written by his own personal hero, the fourth Hokage. This is awesome, but I've never seen chakra level A5 before. The boy had an epiphany as he considered the requirements. I've always been told I have low chakra capacity, but what if it's just my control that's low? It would explain why I can do transformation illusions, since they need less control than clones. He nervously gulped. Might as well try it out. And so, with no regard for the danger, Naruto, completely starstruck, decided he would attempt the technique. He closed the scroll, found a log, and tried his best to apply the seal. He felt a sting in his hand as he did so, promoting him to quickly remove his hand from the log. He was able to see in the nightly glow that he had indeed marked the log, with a string of ancient linguistic characters, along with something odd. Why is the log bleeding? At first perplexed, Naruto wiped the blood off the log with his thumb, before realizing that it was probably his own blood strange, considering he hadn't cut his hand at all. Naruto turned his palm around and noticed that it was covered in blood, from the bottom of his palm to the tips of his fingers. Luckily, the bleeding had stopped, so he just wiped it on his other arm. After all, it would have been a shame to sully his outfit. Naruto then skipped over to the other end of the clearing, and took a deep breath. All right, I can do this. I can do this I can do this, I can do this. He continued to breathe deeply, going faster and faster with each breath, attempting to clear his mind before attempting the technique. Wait. What if I end up summoning the log to myself instead? Shaking his head, he looked around for a solution. He mulled it over, eventually coming up with the idea to grab a bundle of sticks from nearby branches and plant them at his origin point. Okay. Now that's all set. Am I really ready for this? Beads of sweat began to drip from the boy's forehead. All the tension of possibly failing to graduate, stealing the scroll, betraying Mizuki's trust by reading the scroll, and all of the potential devastation the flying thunder could cause rose within him. Yet, I feel so. Alive. What is this? In Naruto's mind, all pistons were firing now. He was eager not only to perform the technique, but to figure out everything he could about it as soon as he could. So came the idea to test the illusion of instantaneous transportation. Naruto reached into his inside vest pocket, pulling out a stopwatch that had been gifted to him by Iruka sensei his brow narrowed in spite of the man, who had been unexpectedly cold to him that morning. A grunt of anger dispelled any further thoughts of Aruka as Naruto decided to go forth with his plan. This thing's supposed to be instantaneous, but just in case it isn't, I'll set my timer to a minute. Fiddling with the object, Naruto readied the timer. Naruto breathed deeply once more, focused his chakra onto the log, and activated the timer as he prayed. Take me there now. Before he even knew it, he was standing right above the log, which now lied between his legs. He almost didn't need to double check what he had done he physically felt the pull of his chakra from the sticks to the log. Nonetheless, 
a quick look back and forth between the log and the bundle of sticks, as well as the fact that that not even a second had passed on the running timer, confirmed what the blonde had known deep within his heart. The technique was a success. Naruto's eyes widened, and a wild smile appeared on his face as he began to break into a hushed chuckle. The hushed chuckle quickly turned into uncontrolled, maniacal laughter at his achievement. The forest echoed with his unhinged voice, ringing through the night. Anyone none the wiser would think that some sort of hyena had found its way into the hidden leaf, as Naruto continued to lose himself in this feelings. Naruto ran out of breath, but nonetheless continued to laugh. He wheezed, coughed, and fell to his knees, all the while losing his grip on sanity. Dropping the stopwatch, he grabbed onto his stomach in an effort to contain his laughter, but found himself still unable to just stop. Coherent thought had long since been overtaken by raw emotion, effectively emptying Naruto's mind for the moment. Tears poured out of the boy's eyes, himself having completely collapsed onto the ground. Without knowing how long had passed, however, as if in an instant, Naruto stopped laughing. No winding down, no sudden bursts in or out, just a sudden halt of his seizing and howling. Naruto, now calm and breathing right, brought himself up to his knees, then up on his feet. What the hell was that? I was totally wigging out. A sharp breath exited Naruto's body as he pushed his hair back with his hands. Concern creeped up on his mind, as he shook his head to try and clear up his thoughts. Hey, Naruto. There you are. Naruto looked up, spotting Mizuki in a tree above. The younger boy begged, Oh God, is it past midnight? Please tell me it is. Please please please. Mizuki snickered, Yeah, yeah, it's about a quarter past, actually. Naruto tumbled down in relief. Ah, oh, that's great. So I get to graduate, right? Well, not exactly. Naruto scoffed. Wh what? You said if I stole a secret scroll, and managed to evade everyone until midnight, I'd pass. Mizuki yawned, his smile seeming crueler by the second. I lied. Naruto's heart sank. What? The truth is, I made a bet with some of my friends that I could actually get you to do something so stupid. I'm still kinda shocked that you actually did it. I should really be thanking you I'm 500 Ryo richer cuz of you. So. Just give me the scroll and I'll tell the Hokage you got confused or something. I'll just tell the Hokage the truth. You can try, but it'd be your word against mine. Who's he gonna trust? Some crazy retard, or the Chunin who's his teacher? I. Naruto was heartbroken. He slowly began to cry as he picked up the scroll. All that. And for what? Just to find out I'm the biggest idiot that's ever lived. What's wrong with me? Stupid idiot. As he received the scroll, Mizuki commented, Come on, kid, is it really that bad? It's just a harmless prank. Naruto sniffled, wiping his tears with his bloody arm, as he whined, You wouldn't get it. Sniffle people like you are just mean and assholes for the hell of it. You don't care how I feel. Asshole. Sniffle, Mizuki couldn't have cared less. Shit. I didn't think he'd take it this hard. And no one's taught me what to do with a crying kid. And what does he mean, people like me, is this little pushover getting short with me? The man rolled his eyes and ordered, come on, let's get going. He sent a message on his pager, then grabbed Naruto's clean arm, pulling him out of the clearing to lead him through the forest. All the while, Naruto continued wiping his tears, which were flowing steadily but silently, unintentionally covering his eyelids and brow in blood. Naruto had always been a very emotional person, to the point of borderline instability. He'd compared his emotional fits to a roller coaster in the past, going high and low and somehow looping around. This damn low's pretty low, though. A wave of depression panged at the walls of his mind he was used to it, but that never made it any easier. The boy was prone to strong emotion by nature, and sometimes there was just no helping it. He just stumbled along with his teacher, cursing his own existence all along the way as Mizuki continued communicating on his pager. Eventually, they had made their way onto the main path in the forest, and soon after, were out of the woods, finding themselves on a stone path in the village. It was there that they were approached by none other than Aruka, one of the absolute last people Naruto wanted to see at this moment. Aruka gasped in a mix of relief and worry, as he kneeled in front of Naruto. Sternly, he asked, What the hell were you thinking, Naruto? The younger boy, still completely down in the dumps, gave no real answer. He just cried and babbled, Arjabebadoda, sniffling and wiping his eyes. 
Iruki, confused, questioned, what? Mizuki cut in with, he got confused or something. Naruto momentarily broke his crying at the lame excuse. He began breathing deeply to catch his breath, and stared at Mizuki in perplexity. Really? That's what you're sticking with? How am I the retard here? Iruka was doubly confused, as he pressed further. Naruto, just what were you confused about? Bitterly, breaking eye contact, Naruto spat, none o er business. Not like it matters to yawn either. Iruka winced. He felt pain in his own heart, as he tried to repair Naruto's hurt feelings. Listen. Remember what we were talking about last night? At the ramen stand? Why yeah. Well, I was thinking about, and, I think you should know something. What is it? I was kinda the same way when I was your age. Orphaned, attention starved, angry at everything. I used to lash out like you did. Why do y'all stop? I guess I just realized that it was kind of a massive waste of my time and energy. No matter how much attention I got, it was never enough. I wised up. Though Naruto appreciated Aruka's sentiment, he was still confused. How does that help me in the slightest? Does he really think I care that he was the same way, or whatever? It was then that Mizuki cut in once more, with an urgent demeanor. Sorry to break up the pity party, Aruka, but I just got paged about some criminals making their way into the forest. What? Damn it Naruto, go home, we'll talk later. And with that, Naruto was left all by his lonesome. Does he really think I'm just gonna watch him leave? Deep in the forest. Aruka and Mizuki tread carefully, with Aruka leading, keeping their senses up for any strange sound, sight, smell. Anything that could give them a sign as to where the criminals were. Unbeknownst to them, Naruto had followed them all the way, sticking to treetops as he stalked his teachers. The older boys made their way into a clearing, and had crossed it halfway, when suddenly. Thud. A kanai was thrown right in front of Aruka's feet. The chunin stepped back as three men stepped out of the shadows. Wearing ski masks and covered in black, the strange men towered over the chunin, seeming to ooze intimidation. The tallest and biggest one, clearly the leader, spoke up. Weren't supposed to be some fodder chunin showing up. The next tallest, his direct subordinate, replied. Must have been some other incident here. Primary target is usually the closest to this place. The third man, who stood like a mouse among his peers, yet still high above the chunin, put in his own two cents. We should just kill him. It'll take them out of the equation quickly, and maybe that brush-headed bastard is gonna slip up if he sees his allies' heads detached from their bodies. The second tallest added, Naw. Nah, Let's cut their heads off, and then sew them onto the other. The boss's voice boomed, Shut up ya morons, you can do whatever ya want with these idiots' heads after we catch our target. The Chunin could only watch, as they had been completely frozen in fear. But just then, another Kanai was thrown into the fray this time, at the feet of the leading criminal. The criminals put their guards up, believing their target had arrived. Instead, what they saw next was a little boy standing in the clearing with them. Strangely enough, no one had seen him actually arrive, he just showed up. Darkness shrouded Naruto's figure, a raccoon like blood mask on his face, as cold, burning hatred oozed out of his voice. Don't touch Uruka sensei, or I'll kill ya. Mizuki deadpanned. Oh sure, but if they touch me, I guess that's fine. Naruto turned around to respond, but just as soon as he did, the leading criminal pulled out a giant shuriken. He threw the shuriken at Naruto who was picked up and turned around by Aruka. Naruto watched helplessly as the shuriken dug into Aruka's back. Horror ran through Naruto and Mizuki's spines, as Aruka collapsed, dropping Naruto flat on his buttocks under him. The second tallest criminal brandished an axe, circling around the trio to stand behind Mizuki, who was still completely frozen. Mizuki could feel the man swinging his axe. Shit, 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 I'm gonna die. Why can't I move? Naruto, trapped under Aruka, struggled to escape. That Mizuki might be a stupid bastard, but I can't just watch him die. Naruto struggled on and on, to no avail. He searched for something he could grab onto anything at all, when he noticed a familiar block of wood right behind the axe man. This is the same clearing as before, as the would-be axe murderer brought his weapon up and around his head, and went in full swing. He was suddenly stabbed in his bicep. He emitted a girly shriek of pain dropping his axe, noticing the kanai that had been embedded in his arm. 
The culprit was none other than Naruto. By stroke of Naruto's luck, the Axeman had unknowingly stepped just a few yards in front of the log Naruto had marked earlier. Without missing a beat, Naruto used the flying thunder to reach the kanai he had just thrown, yanking it out of the criminal's arm and throwing it towards the leader. However, the other subordinate was quick to push his boss out of the way, taking the knife in the back of the neck for him. This allowed the boss to recuperate, stepping back as he pulled out another large shuriken. Not gonna let this little bastard get one over on us. Before he could act, however, another participant joined the battle. Leaping and landing right between Naruto and the leading criminal was a man with brush-like silver hair, a feature which further betrayed his already deceptive youth. This man wore a mask over his mouth and nose, with his ninja headband leaning over his left eye, and a standard John in green vested attire. He looked up at the criminal with his menacingly emotionless eye, and quipped. You really picked the short straw tonight, my friend. What say you surrender right here and now spare us all any further trouble? The criminal sighed and dropped his shuriken. He slowly brought his hands behind his head, responding, All right, all right. The Jonin smiled somehow with his single eye. Finally, someone listens to. Puff. Oh, come on. The Jonin yelled. Immediately, he began to chase the criminal, with Naruto in tow, without the man's knowledge. Naruto followed the older men throughout the forest, eagerly waiting for either one of them to make a move. This is lame. Can't someone just kill someone already? Naruto made the sentiment known when he shouted, Hey, brush head, do something already. The Jonin quickly replied, Can't had a long mission a while back and I've just about run out of chakra. The criminal, feeling the opportunity to strike, began to spin around to throw a kanai at the man. However, the Jonin seemed to be ready for this. Before the kanai had even left the criminal's hand, the Jonin had completed hand signs that made arm like roots eject from a tree incapacitating the criminal by completely covering his arms and legs. The criminal, visibly shaken with fear, could barely speak a word. S so. That's the great elite ninja Kakashi Hitaki, huh? Naruto followed Kakashi as he approached the criminal, pestering, I thought you said you were out of chakra. Smugly, Kakashi responded, Deception is one of the greatest tools that a shinobi can use. To be honest, I haven't had a good mission in weeks. Curiously, Naruto asked, one of the greatest tools, what are the others? Kakashi chuckled at the boy. Well, one of them is the simple act of knowing. For example, I have known that some creepy little gang has been stalking me for a while. On account of the times they stalked me, I knew they would try to lure me into the forest at this time of night, when they knew I would be closest to the deep woods, and furthest from any other shinobi. I knew that I was their target and I knew exactly how they planned to capture me. The only thing I didn't know was that you'd show up. Though I probably should have expected as much, what with the Hokage's little announcement and all. Naruto just stared at Kakashi, dumbfounded. The criminal's ears perked up at this opportunity for espionage. Fortunately, Kakashi was still quite a few steps ahead of him. He stared the man in his eye and mockingly said, and that's as much as you'll get out of me. Don't be embarrassed, though, if our roles were switched, you would have gotten even less. He turned back to Naruto, smiling. As for you, you're on the track to becoming a genin, but you seem to have forgotten a core tenet of shinobi. Naruto began to think about what Kakashi meant. His mind spun around the events of the night, scanning for what shinobi virtue he could have missed. Oh crap, Aruka sensei. Naruto gasped, turning around immediately to get back to Aruka. Kakashi smiled. As Naruto returned to the initial clearing, he heard a conversation taking place. Not wanting to barge in, he decided to hide behind a tree and eavesdrop. First was Mizuki's voice. Don't sweat it, Aruka. Help's coming. I just wanna know. Why would you go so far for that little brat? Isn't his his fault you're an orphan? Naruto was intrigued, yet insulted at the same time. He listened as Aruka's voice came next. You mean all that demon kid nonsense. Come on, Mizuki, you know as well as I do that he's not actually the demon. Naruto wondered. Demon? Mizuki cut his co-teacher off. Yeah yeah, I know, Kanai in a scroll you've only said it a hundred thousand times. But still, what's so special about this kid? There was a short pause before Aruka spoke again. It's his persistence, to be honest. His persistence? Yeah. Half the village probably more hates his guts, but he's still trying so hard to get to that point where he can protect them. 
He wants to be Hokage, you know. Hokage. Really? Yeah, and I really believe he can do it. I've told him that we're a bit similar I mean, we're both unstable but the truth is that his potential is so much higher than mine. I used to have the same ambitions he has now, but I let the world drag me down and I've given up on becoming even a Jonin, much less Hokage. By now, Naruto was in tears. Silently breaking down, he began to cry. He managed to compose himself quickly, however, hoping to hear more of the conversation between his teachers. He really thinks that highly of me. Mizuki continued the conversation. But you're barely in your twenties. You can still do all that stuff, Aruka. I know that much, but I just don't have the will for it anymore. And that demon kid, is your best bet? Naruto's ears perked up. What demon, are they talking about? And how am I it? He cleared his throat and straightened his back, before stepping out into the clearing and approaching his teachers, noticing that Aruka was slumped up against a tree, with Mizuki kneeling beside him. Aruka and Mizuki tensed up as Naruto sternly asked, What's all this about a demon? Aruka awkwardly chuckled, You h heard all that? You bet I did. Now gimme an answer. Aruka and Mizuki exchanged unsure looks. Though, Aruka seemed to overcome his uncertainty with ease. He whispered, I think I should tell him, Mizuki. Are you crazy, Aruka? You know that's banned speech. Sometimes the law is more of a suggestion than a rule. Besides he's gotta know at some point, right? Mizuki grimaced. It's your funeral, man. He sighed and turned away from Aruka. Naruto's pleading eyes pierced into Aruka. With a sad smile, Aruka told him, Naruto. You obviously know about the nine-tailed demon fox attack. Naruto nodded, motioning for Aruka to continue. The official story is that the fourth Hokage, expelled the demon from this world basically, that he killed it. Naruto squinted at his teacher. Go on. The truth is that he had to seal the demon in something, or, someone. What? For reasons beyond my understanding, he chose to seal the demon inside a newborn baby. Aruka paused. Am I really gonna tell him? Who was it? It was its well. It's, Aruka groaned. I hadn't thought about what I was going to say. I just made that decision on the spot. And just look at that face. How can I break his heart like this? Naruto blinked, anticipating what he was about it be told. Aruka sighed through his teeth and finally came out with it. It was you, Naruto. You're the container for the demon. That's why so many villagers hate you. Naruto tilted his head to the side in confusion. W what? That doesn't make any sense. How could I be the demon? Why would the Hokage say the demon is dead if I'm it? Aruka quickly corrected the boy. No, you're not the demon itself, Naruto, you're just containing it. It's like a coup. Aruka felt a dirty, annoyed glare from Mizuki. Recouping his words, he stated, it's like, uh, a sandwich, in a plastic box? Mizuki groaned, real smooth, Aruka. Naruto seemed dumbfounded. After a contemplatory breath, he offhandedly remarked, I guess that explains the tattoo on my stomach. After receiving no response from his teachers, he began to feel awkward. Silence, above all else, struck a chord in his discomfort. Naruto rolled his eyes and sarcastically added, and my innate desire to destroy every human that crosses my path. Iruka and Mizuki harmonized with, what? Promoting Naruto to explain. He shrugged and told them, it was a joke. But like, come on. You're the adults here. Carry the conversation. You still haven't told me why the history books say that the demon was killed. Iruka chuckled and responded, yeah. He made it a law that no one can speak about what happened that night. My guess is that he wanted to protect you. Protect me. From what? Well, a good amount of the villagers have been vindictive about the whole demon fox issue. There's been some close calls with you nearly being attacked, as well. So, it'd make sense that the Hokage would make it illegal for people to tell others that you're holding the demon. Safety. Mizuki added, probably the same reason you're living in a decent, low-key neighborhood with that hottie, Anko. Naruto ignored that, focusing on replying to Iruka. But wouldn't it be more dangerous to make that sort of speech illegal? Like, it's the truth, isn't it? Censoring it just gives way to even worse rumors, like a conspiracy about me or something. And falsely altering the annals of history kinda feels like a major sin, you know? Iruka shook his head, smiling. That's classic, Naruto. Always going against the grain. I really admire that about you. Then, 
Naruto continued ranting about the holes he'd found in the speech suppression law. From the semantics of it, to its failure as legislation, and all sorts of other things that droned on in his teacher's minds. That was, until, an angered feminine voice reached Naruto's ears none other than Anko. There you are, you little brat. Thus, Naruto scurried his way home with a purple ball of flaming fury following him all the way. Naruto's apartment in the middle of the night, Naruto began squirming around in bed. A terrible dream plagued his mind. In the dream, Naruto was stranded in a sea of pure white. Though the ground was dry, Naruto noticed that his feet made a ripple effect in it. Come to think of it, why am I butt naked? Naruto covered his privates with his hands, and looked around to see if he could find anything. He walked in a single direction, noting that his footsteps sounded like a G note on a piano. After less than a minute, Naruto had decided that he wasn't getting anywhere. He stretched out his arms, yawning loudly. Just then, felt a sharp of pain on his torso, as if there were a thousand paper cuts on his stomach. Doubling over, he felt blood seeping through his fingers, and he collapsed from the pain. Now on his hands and knees, blood was painting the ground in red, as blood was falling from the seal holding the nine-tailed fox. Naruto watched in horror as the seal disappeared, emptying out in a pool of red on the floor, which then slithered in front of him to take a three-dimensional form. Now in front of Naruto, stood the unseemly shape of a humanoid fox. It stood ten feet tall, and its fur was like fire, magnetically pulled towards the blonde. It taunted, tell me. How does it feel to have the fear of God gripping your heart? The pain fading, Naruto let go of a trail of bleeding spit, as he mustered the strength to respond. I'm not afraid of you, you. Furry thing. TCH, TCH. Why deny it? Deny what? I'm seriously not scared of you. I am the spirit of the nine-tailed fox, fated for damnation. I have slaughtered countless peoples with no regard for their crimes. You would be foolish to dismiss my superiority. What superiority? If killin' and gettin' a high death count makes you better than everyone, I'd rather stay lame. Besides, aren't you the nine-tailed fox? You're sealed inside of me, virtue of the fourth Hokage. You're like, my bitch. It tried to intimidate Naruto by distorting its face to hellish proportions, shouting, I'm nobody's bitch. I am the bane of mankind. Face to face with his prisoner, Naruto merely yawned again. Don't care. Stop bothering me. I got a test tomorrow. The fox demon relented, wasteful brat, I will break this facade, sooner or later, as it melted back into the ground. Naruto admonished, I'll turn you into a puddle of shit, before you even get close, as the demon crawled up his leg and back into the form of the seal. When Naruto woke up, he had a sudden sense of urgency. I still can't make a clone. Panicking. The boy's mind was occupied with any possible solutions as he performed his morning ablutions. What am I gonna do what am I gonna do what am I gonna do? After splashing his face with cold water, he gave himself some time to breathe. Alright, just think. Maybe they'll let me pass for knowing the flying thunder. Nah. But what if? After leaving the bathroom, Naruto walked back into his bedroom, grabbing one of his notebooks. He tore a single sheet out of it, which he then ripped in half horizontally. Promptly, he marked both pages with the flying thunder seal. After that, he folded both pages to the size of a pebble, and placed them in his pockets, smirking all the while. Naruto imagined how he would bypass the test. I'll just discreetly throw these folds of paper on the floor next to each other, then use the flying thunder to transport to each fold so fast that it looks like there's two of me. As for the smoke made by a conventional clone, I'll use the transformation technique to add the illusion of an extra button on my shirt that'll work. Delightfully devilish. Hee hee ha. Upon arrival to the kitchen, Naruto found Anko munching on breakfast, waiting for him. Oomph. Nrrtu gulp ahem. Lord Hokage told me that you're getting an honorary graduation for getting in his office and stealing the scroll like that said, it shows promise in the ninja arts. Naruto pouted. Nah. I'm gonna take that test anyways. I don't want handouts I'm talking responsibility for my own ability. I was hoping you'd say that. Actually, Mizuki said something similar. Mizuki. What do you mean? Well, he confessed that he initially intended to lie about how you got the scroll, but that your actions influenced him to be honest, even if it got him in trouble. Said the same thing about taking responsibility. No kidding. Mizuki. 
if even he can own up like that. Maybe I just gotta be a man about this. Ninja Academy the whole walk to his school, Naruto juggled his options in his head. Maybe I shouldn't do that jazz with the flying thunder, it'd be dishonest. But then again, deception is a great shinobi tool. Maybe I am morally justified in faking it, but even so, wouldn't it be a shame if I became a shinobi without deserving to be one? But, Aruka sensei and Sakura have worked so hard to help me pass this far. If I fail, wouldn't I be failing them, too? What if I do the flying thunder and lose my shit again like last night? I'll get hauled off to an asylum. Aw oh man, I wish this would be easy. As Naruto walked into the team assignment room, he took a look at everyone from his class and others who were present for their exam. Present were his former classmates, along with some others he was vaguely familiar with. Of them all, he recognized only a few those of the wealthier ninja kids who had taken advanced classes for specialized training. Hanada Hayuga. Weird. Stuttering all the time. Shikamaru Nara. Lazy, pineapple-headed, low energy, lazy asshole. Lazy lazy lazy. Sasuke Uchiha. Weird asshole. Having a dead family isn't a personality. Naruto found personal tragedy when he noticed who was sitting next to Sasuke, blushing and all. Sakura. Come to think of it, every girl's hung up on that emo freak. Man, this blows. I hope that's an uncomfortable blush and not a lovey de vey one. Ack. Nonetheless, the blonde made a beeline to fill the seat next to his crush, whose blush slowly vanished as he approached. Each step felt like another minute passing by, as Naruto locked eyes with her. Man. Just look at her. That settles it I'm definitely doing the flying thunder. No doubt about it. If I fail, it'll just show her that I've wasted her time. Strangely, Naruto received a meaner than usual greeting from Sakura this morning. Hey, jackass, get your butt over here. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this. Sounds like she really means it. Ouch. The boy sat next to her, and she pulled out a piece of paper. Scooting closer to him, she showed him its contents. It was a strangely well-drawn diagram of the boy with all sorts of mathematical numbers and symbols assigned to projected chakra coils. Sakura did him the favor of explaining what it meant. Okay, Naruto, I was up until midnight figuring this stuff out, but I think I've finally found a way for you to do that clone jutsu. Naruto nodded. Aha! Uh -huh. Analyzing the diagram. Sakura grabbed his arm and urged, I swear to God, if you just follow what I've drawn, you've got a 100% chance of getting the technique right. Naruto chuckled. Yeah. Well, what's the margin of error on that? This earned him a noogie from the girl, who spoke through strained teeth, if you just follow what it says, Z-E-R-O, before letting him go. Giving the diagram a once-over, Naruto remarked, this is really detailed. He turned his head to Sakura and grinned. You were up, till midnight making this for me? Sakura suddenly blushed again. Once more, Unknown to Naruto whether it was nervousness born from discomfort, or from affection. She stammered, I just think it'd be a damn shame if you were the only one in our class who failed, obviously. Not like I like you or anything, idiot. Naruto relented, all right, all right, and began carefully reading the diagram. As a matter of fact, the boy had gotten so involved in it that he hadn't realized it when everyone in his class had taken their tests and passed. He remained unaware until he felt a sudden nudge from his left side, which he responded to by turning to the perpetrator, Sakura. Dumbass, the proctor's calling you up. Naruto was in shock at his lack of awareness, snapping his head to see the proctor it was one of the Hokage's sons, Asuma Serutobi, a man Naruto recognized very well scanning the room for him. And of course that guy's got a sig in his mouth. This is a classroom, full of children, man. Don't you have any common decency? Once the pair met each other's eyes, Asuma beckoned, Come on, Naruto, you're the last one. Setting the diagram down on his desk, Naruto scrambled to get up, following a whisper from Sakura. I'll kick your ass if you fail. The boy scampered to his spot in the front of the class, motivated and ready. Asuma told him, You know the drill clone jutsu. Naruto nodded, Yeah, yeah. Before anything else, he nervously gulped. All eyes were on him now, it was do or die. The entire class was muttering, anticipating Naruto's success, though they were more inclined to believe he would fail. Sakura was spotted by the boy, visibly praying for his success. Nonetheless, Naruto had to perform the clone jutsu properly. 
Recalling the diagram that Sakura had given him, Naruto tried his best to concentrate on the proper execution of the clone jutsu according to it. Naruto closed his eyes and made the cross hand sign for the technique. Feeling his chakra coils flare up, the darkness behind his eyelids was slowly becoming more yellow the color his chakra tended to emit. Then, with a deep breath, Naruto locked his chakra in, affirming the technique he intended to use, and hesitantly opened his eyes. Lo and behold, right beside Naruto was a visible, carbon copy clone of himself. The class went silent. Eyes wide those who knew Naruto as the boy's success in performing the technique was a miracle to behold. Naruto looked behind him to take a look at his proctor. He looks like he's seen a ghost, and the sig's fallen out his mouth and landed on the floor. The wooden floor. Isn't that a fire hazard? Naruto opened his mouth to speak, and was surprised when two voices spoke. So, did I pass? Are my clones supposed to act like me? Asuma, unmoving, softly replied, Yep, you pass. Congratulations. Both Naruto's leapt into the air, shouting, All right, I did it. Sakura felt a mix of pride and some other unfamiliar emotions. Now there's two of him. What have I done? Without sparing a thought to it, Naruto dispelled his clone. He ran back to his seat in the classroom, plopping down next to Sakura, whom he profusely thanked. I owe you big, Sakura. I mean it. Sakura merely replied, Yeah well, don't think too much of it. I just helped you out because. Uh. Naruto finished for her. Yeah, yeah so your tutoring record looks good or whatever. Sakura smirked. Yeah, sure. And who knows, maybe in a few decades, I'll be known as the doctor who helped the Hokage graduate. It's quite the pipe dream, isn't it? From the front of the room, Asuma announced, All right, now, I'm gonna be telling all of you what teams you're in. Once I call your names, you will group up with your team at the proper seats. Listen up. Team 7 conveniently already at the right table and altogether Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno, Naruto Uzumaki. Sakura quickly spotted Ino who had been forced to stand up in the back of the room to make space for a student assigned to Team 3 and stuck her tongue out at her. Ino returned the gesture, somewhat fuming. Damn you, Sakura. Stealing Sasuke all for yourself. Sakura turned away and pouted. It's great that I'm with Sasuke, Ino pig can bite me, but Naruto. He just makes everything confusing. Suddenly the realization hit that she had been giving her blonde teammate the side eye. Now aware that he had been making eye contact with her as well, she quickly looked down, as Naruto without the intention mimicked this action. Man. It's great that I'm with Sakura. Emo freak can go sit on a sword for all I care, not like he'd really hate that. Stupid bastard. Meanwhile, Asuma continued his announcements. Team 8 Hanada Hayuga. Shino Abarame, Kiba Inazuka. Team 9 is out of this year's rotation. Team 10 Ino Yamanaka, Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi. Once all the teams were assigned, Asuma took a long drag from cigarette, before removing it and puffing a humongous ball of smoke. Getting vertigo. Shit. I don't get paid enough for this. The class patiently waited for the man, as he placed his hands on the desk and sighed deeply to make yet another announcement. All right, now you just gotta wait for your assigned John and Sensei to come by and pick you up. Ino Shikacho, you're with me. With that, Team 10 swiftly exited the building. Over the next 30 minutes, elite team leaders came and went, picking up their teams and leaving just as soon as they'd come. One by one by one, like clockwork, over a slow period of time. By the end of the first half of an hour, all the teams had gotten their teachers and left all except for one, Team 7 who sat alone in the middle of the classroom. As time suddenly began to feel excruciatingly slower, the new genin began to feel excessive boredom. The voices of both Naruto and Sakura began, so, before cutting off, each to let the other speak. Though both insisted the other go first, Naruto won out, convincing Sakura on account of the principal, ladies first, which she reluctantly accepted. Sakura cleared her throat. So, let's get to know each other. Almost immediately, the silent Sasuke, head still in his hands, firmly asserted, no. Sakura coiled, whereas Naruto sat with his mouth agape. He then mocked, guess the mighty Uchiha don't inherit politeness, huh? Sasuke scoffed. We don't inherit retardation either, shut up. Sakura frowned. Jesus, I didn't think he'd be so rude. 
Naruto stood up out of his seat, his face turning red as he fumed. However, Sakura was quick to notice this. She tugged at his hand, ordering, sit down. At least the two of us can talk. Naruto grumbled, but obeyed nonetheless. He sat with his arms crossed, starting the conversation. So. Got any siblings? Sakura facepalmed. You've been at my house, you know I have a little brother. You've met him a hundred times. Naruto squirmed. Yeah. Sorry. Dumb question. The girl shook her head. In this context, sure. Why don't you try again? The boy did as such, this time coming up with, what's your favorite movie? Sakura's eye twitched. You know what it is. You watched it with me that one time. Naruto sheepishly chuckled. Yeah, yeah I remember now. And you fell asleep. Hey, you told me we'd never speak of that. I made the rule. I get to break it. Thus, the next few minutes passed by in silence. The silence was broken when Naruto had a sudden bout of excitement. He proclaimed, Oh, oh, I got a really good question. Sakura warned, If you ask me what color panties I'm wearing, I will rip your head off. Naruto stammered, What? Nn no, no. What kind of question is that? Sakura answered, Just saying. Naruto huffed. I was just wondering how you came up with all that math and stuff for me to do the clone jutsu. Sakura's brow rose slightly, as she told him, well, it wasn't easy. I was about to tear my hair out figuring out the correct proportions of chakra and whatnot. Something's still bothering me about it, but I just can't put my finger on it. We're really lucky you were able to make sense of it. Naruto nodded in amazement. That's so cool. Sakura affirmed, isn't it? It was really good for my brain, I think. With a smug look on his face, Naruto placed his hands behind his head and leaned back in his chair, remarking, Then I guess I should be saying, You're welcome, hey. Not wanting to find issue in this statement, Sakura merely sighed and leaned back in her chair, arms crossed, lightly grinning. Yeah, sure. Another two hours had passed. Spotty conversations filled the silence every now and then, but Naruto and Sakura made themselves comfortable nonetheless. Sasuke, as before, merely sat like a ghost, ignoring his new teammates, having fallen asleep. Naruto stood up and got out of his seat, stepping into the aisle to stretch. Hey, Sakura, he informed, I'm gonna make our fool of a sensei regret talking his sweet ass time. As Naruto skipped to the front of the room, Sakura curiously followed him, questioning, what are you gonna do? She stood still and watched as the boy picked up an eraser from the blackboard, opened the door ajar, and set the eraser on the top of the door. She scoffed. You really think an elite ninja's gonna fall for something that dumb? I hope so. Naruto turned to face her and replied, it's worth a shot. If he can't even show up on time, who knows what other moral failings we'll find in his demeanor. As the new genin heard footsteps approaching, Sakura beckoned, hey, Naruto, come up here he might get suspicious if he sees you. Without protest, Naruto hopped over to Sakura, standing in the middle of the classroom with her. With the increasing volume of the footsteps, the children's anticipation followed the pattern. Each and every step was like another burst of eagerness, their hearts pumping faster and faster. Sure enough, the man who was approaching pushed open the door, walking right under the eraser, which thumped on his head and clouded him in white powder. The children in front of him erupted, doubling over in laughter. Sakura tried to control it, as it was impolite, but she just couldn't help herself. Letting go of Naruto's hand something she hadn't been aware she was doing, she nearly fell, and used the boy's shoulder to hold herself up. As she rose back up, laughter dwindling, Naruto still hadn't stopped. She tugged at his shirt and commanded, A all right Naruto, I t think that's enough. Naruto began to slow down his laughter, but when he and his teammate took another look at their sensei taking note of his silver hair now spotted white, with his uncovered eyelashes fluttering chalk away, sending it down onto his face mask they erupted once again. Deadpan, the man stared at the children in front of him. You're all idiots. Wiping away tears, finally ceasing his laughter, Naruto gave the man a once-over. Brush-headed, eye-covered, masked up, it's that guy. Naruto whined, hey, Cyclops? You're our sensei? The man responded, yep, that's me. Now follow me to the roof. And wake up the kid that's dozed off, for God's sake. With that, the man climbed out the window, and walked up the wall. Eager to get on with whatever it was they needed to do, the genin of Team 7 hustled to the roof. 
Sasuke groggily stumbled, still sleepy, whereas Naruto and Sakura ran as fast as their little legs could take them. On the roof on the north end of the roof of the academy was a bench, wide enough for exactly three pre-teen children. The sensei took it. His genin, therefore, were relegated to standing in front of him, lined up the same way they were in the team assignment room. The sensei ordered, All right, let's get to know each other. Pointing to Naruto, he added, You first, blondie. Naruto and Sakura simultaneously protested, Hey, you're our sensei, you go first. The man sighed. Looking at Naruto, he stated, We met last night, kid. Don't you remember my name? Naruto stammered, Oh, uh, it's cock a shaka laka his teammates stared at him perplexed what kind of name is that his parents must really hate him the man corrected a for effort f for everything else my name is kakashi hataki he continued i'm fond of lazing about and i'm averse to work my hobbies are standing and breathing my goal is to well i'll keep it a little secret for now it's your turn this guy's a freak a rama Naruto started, my name is. Kakashi cut him off. No no no, smart mouth. We're going in the reverse order this time. It creates a sense of balance. Naruto grumbled. Thus, Sasuke answered, my name is Sasuke Uchiha. I'm not fond of anything. I dislike traitors. I don't have any hobbies. My goal no, my mission is to kill a certain man. Sakura felt pity and concern. I hope we can help him. Naruto was less sympathetic. What sort of maniac says something like that? Out loud? In front of people? In casual conversation? With people he barely knows? As an icebreaker? What a sick freak? Kakashi remained emotionless. He gestured to Sakura. Pinky, go. Sakura stated, My name is Sakura Haruno, I like being accepted, and I dislike bad people and bugs. My hobbies are taking care of my brother, jogging, surfing the web watching TV, and studying medicine. My dream is to become a doctor and save people's lives. Naruto silently gushed over her. Man, she's so cool. Kakashi nodded. Very nice. Okay, short stuff, it's just you now. Sakura and Sasuke chuckled at the nickname, whereas Naruto didn't appreciate it much. He stated, my name is Naruto Uzumaki well, legally it's Uzumaki but I don't really know what my last name is because I never had parents and old man Serutobi just gave me the respected Uzumaki clan name as a placeholder. But I can't be in Uzumaki since I don't have red hair. Also, ever notice how none of them live in this village anymore? Not since way before I was born at least. Regardless, I really really like ramen, and I really like it when people pay attention to me. But I don't like it when people target me for rudeness or other attacks. That's annoying. I don't like it. I also don't like liars and scammers and stuff. My hobbies are learning how to be a ninja and going to the going to the, uh, nowhere. My dream is to become Hokage. Really, I just want everyone's respect, but since the Hokage is respected by everybody, that means I gotta be Hokage. I gotta. I'm gonna be like the fourth Hokage, since he was the most respected, but I'm gonna be better. The team couldn't make heads or tails of what was wrong with his boy. What sort of maniac just goes on and rambles like that? Out loud? In front of people? In casual conversation? With people he barely knows? As an icebreaker? Before his train of thoughts could derail, Kakashi plainly stated, Now we all know each other. He ordered, There's a bridge over Namikaze River yes, like the fourth Hokage you can't miss it. Be there at 7 o'clock sharp tomorrow morning for an extra test. Naruto complained, Extra test? I thought we became genin by performing the clone jutsu. Kakashi smiled. What can I say? You thought wrong. You're not genin until you receive your official genin forehead protectors. And as I live and breathe, I see no such article on either of your bodies. So Namikaze River Bridge, 7 am tomorrow. Then, he leaned in and whispered, Be careful, you might regret eating breakfast. Naruto's apartment upon arriving home, Naruto let out an exasperated sigh as he met Anko who sat in the living room on her personal chair. She immediately inquired, You've got that bitchy look on your face again. What happened? Naruto answered, Well, I passed the exam, but that brush-headed one-eyed freak of a sensei says we gotta take another test tomorrow. Anko shot up. That freaky sensei wouldn't happen to be Kakashi, would it? Naruto replied, Actually, yeah, it's him. 
He noticed a dreamy look on Anko's face as he continued. How do you know H? Oh no. Is he the guy you're doing the devil's dance with? Oh my god. Before Anko could respond not that she needed to, as her face told the whole story Naruto plugged his ears with his fingers, droning, L-A-L-A-L-A-L-A-L-A-L-A-L-A, as he ran into his room. Next morning, elsewhere in the village as Sakura walked to the rendezvous, she had the fortune of coming across Sasuke. But that all just might change soon. She swooped into his side, greeting, Hey, Sasuke. Sasuke stayed silent. Sakura chose to continue the conversation. Isn't it funny that we're walking here at the same time? We had different schedules at the academy so we never came across each other except for the classes we had together but now we're gonna be meeting each other every day. Sasuke groaned. Why don't you go bother Naruto? Sakura scoffed. Me? Bother Naruto? It's the other way around. Sasuke dryly replied. Based on yesterday, I don't doubt that. Isn't he known for being a bit of an idiot? Sakura responded. Yeah, I guess. I'm pretty sure it's because he's got no parents to teach him right from wrong. He's never had to answer to anyone, and it's made him selfish. My parents would scold me like hell if I pulled the kind of stunts he does. Sasuke stopped. Sakura strolled a few feet in front of him before realizing he had no intention of walking alongside her. She turned around to get a look at him. Sasuke was sulking, staring blankly at the ground. Sakura asked, Hey, Sasuke, why are we stopping? Sasuke's face turned to a hateful glare directed at Sakura, as he answered, Kids without parents always grow up selfish and lonely. Getting scolded by your parents is nothing. W what's gotten into you all of a sudden? You make me sick. I'm going another way, don't follow me. Namikaze River bridge the bridge over the river, though stretching some hundred feet, was understated in its design. Besides the wooden gates at each end, the stone-laden bridge had no defining features to make it look unlike any other. Naruto nonchalantly approached the rendezvous point, irked at the prospect of an extra test, but eager nonetheless. He saw Sakura arrive at the same time, and greeted her. So, Sakura, what did you have for breakfast? What? He said we shouldn't eat breakfast. No, he just suggested it. Besides, if I need to throw up, I'll aim at him. Stupid Cyclops. Naruto? Yeah. The whole, Cyclops, thing isn't gonna be, like, a thing, is it? Maybe. Why? It's gonna get old, quick. No offense. None taken. What about, brush head, it'll run its course. Darn. Maybe we can come up with one together. Within the next few minutes, Sasuke arrived at the bridge. Sakura, swooning over him, greeted, Hey, Sasuke, how's things? Batting her eyelashes. Sasuke monotonously told her, parents still dead, teammates still annoying. Sakura frowned. I'd think that sort of response was cool, if it wasn't so rude, and tragic. Poor Sasuke. Naruto, once again, showed no sympathy. He mocked, no one cares about your family. Can't you just bitch about the weather or something? Sasuke was irked, and replied, yeah, I'll complain about what a nice, sunny day it is. Dumbass. Naruto shot back, that's my point, it's sunny, shouldn't you be bursting into flames? Sasuke scoffed. He'd been furious to begin with, but Naruto's response was almost enough to distract him from his rage. Almost. Instead, Sasuke stayed quiet, attempting to suppress any emotion. He's an annoying piece of shit, but damn it if he's not funny, mustn't. Laugh. In fear that he was unwittingly revealing his reluctant appreciation of Naruto's lowbrow humor, Sasuke attempted to hide his face in his elbow and feign a cough. Then, making some distance, Sasuke walked to the other end of the bridge, leaning over the edge as if he were admiring the view. Naruto groaned, approaching the bench in the middle of the bridge to sit down. Sakura came in tow, placing herself on the other end. Half of an hour had passed, and Kakashi still hadn't arrived. Tired from having broken the habit of eating breakfast, exacerbated by boredom panging against her skull, Sakura felt the need to doze off. She ordered to her blonde acquaintance, Hey, Naruto, scoot over here real quick. Looking back, Naruto questioned, Hum. Why? Because I said so. Alright. Thus, the boy released a hefty sigh, shifting his butt over to the middle of the bench. In turn, Sakura grabbed his arm, pulled it up and around her neck, and leaned into his frail chest. It's not the most comfortable position, 
but I need to sleep, and I don't want a crick in my neck. She looked up at Naruto to gauge his response a wide-eyed blushing mess and demanded, don't make it weird. Just wake me up when Sensei bothers to get here. Naruto cleared his throat and tried as nonchalantly as he could to just reply, sure. The sentiment, however, was betrayed by his heart beating faster and faster. Though Sakura took notice, she was just too tired to care. Hey EY, Sakura, Sensei's here. Sakura squirmed. How long have I been asleep? Why is Naruto whispering? After a few nudges from the younger one, Sakura relented, grumbling as she sat back upright. She looked around, but noticed the absence of Kakashi. Where is he? Naruto whispered back. I saw him coming here and then climbing up a tree just a few seconds ago. Look directly past the center left part of the gate we entered from. The girl rubbed her eyes, and did as told. Past the center left. It's just trees. Wait a minute. What's that black thing? Can it it is, isn't it? As if he were a specter, Kakashi was hidden in a tree branch, unmoving, eyeing his students. He made no advance, nor any acknowledgement of his own existence in his students' view. He's just standing there. Menacingly. Sakura's train of thought was broken when Naruto made a sudden suggestion. Should I throw a rock at him? Sakura stammered. Wh what? Why? I dunno, it just seems appropriate. Besides, ain't like I'm gonna throw a pebble. I'm gonna hit. I am with something big, like a small boulder. How is that supposed to be the better option? He'll remember it. First of all, if you throw a boulder at him, a small boulder. A small boulder. Couldn't he just dodge it? Secondly, I know you're way too scrawny to lift a rock like that. Where are you even gonna find one that big? You got me there. I'll just throw a regular rock. You know what? Just do it. Throw the damn rock. Kill him for all I care. Naruto gleefully replied, Okay. He bounced off of the bench to stand upright, while creating the pretense of stretching. He bent down, picking up a nice fist sized rock, and stood back up, concealing it. The boy set his eyes on his target, the still unmoving Kakashi, and took note of just how strange his behavior was. What's even the point of that? He literally saw that I saw him climb up there. Freak. Naruto fake yawned, then spun around and blasted the rock at Kakashi. To Naruto's surprise, he actually hit his target. The rock smashed Kakashi right on the nose causing the man to fall off the branch he was on, and he landed with a big thud. Then, Kakashi got back up. Rather than respond in any manner comprehensible to his students, he simply climbed back up the tree and set himself upon the same branch, silently stalking them. Sakura noted, Okay, that's pretty creepy. Naruto replied, Tell me about it. Maybe it's a robot. Rolling her eyes, Sakura decided to take action. She stood up, grabbed Naruto's hand, and led him across the bridge. She walked past the gate and towards the tree in which Kakashi stood. Remaining on the branch, Kakashi turned his head to them and greeted, Hey, there. How are ya? Naruto and Sakura shouted back, You're late. Kakashi chuckled, Am I? Sakura accused, You said 7 a.m. 7. A.M. It's almost 8 o'clock now. Kakashi devilishly smiled. I said that the three of you have to be here at 7. I hadn't set any such time upon myself. Naruto and Sakura grumbled, in dismay at their sensei's mind games. Kakashi added, Speaking of the three of you, why is Sasuke still on the bridge, whereas you two are here? You haven't abandoned the poor guy, have ya? Naruto responded, Who cares why he's there? You made us wait for nothing. Kakashi suggested, Well, seeing as how it doesn't matter, how about the two of you come with me to take the test, and we just leave Sasuke hanging? Naruto argued, What? That's crazy. I don't like the guy but he's part of the team, and it'd be real shitty to leave him without telling. Sakura added, Yeah, he's worked really hard to get here. Naruto retorted, No way, he just rides on the coattails of his stupid clan. Sakura flicked his forehead. Stop being so dismissive of the guy. I'm sure he made an honest effort. Naruto shot back. How would you know? You weren't in the same class as him or anything. Sakura quickly corrected, actually, we had honors science together, you'd know that if you were smart enough to get that class. Naruto clapped, that's offensive, I'm not stupid. Sakura scolded, big words coming from Mr. I can't make a stupid clone without having someone else figure it out for me. Nearly tearing up, Naruto choked, 
H.U. that's hurtful. The sight caused Sakura to recoil. I didn't mean to make him cry. She loosened up, lightly placing a hand against Naruto's shoulder, raising an eyebrow. Naruto, confused about the change of pace, and finding Sakura's actions to be unfamiliar, flinched. The girl placed a firmer hand on his shoulder and assured him, Look, I wasn't trying to hurt your feelings or anything. Okay. You're not as dumb as I say, and I shouldn't pester you about getting help, especially not when I provided it. It's just banter. Hearing this, Naruto began to grin. Be banter? Yeah, banter. Now smiling like a jackal, Naruto jumped, laughing, proclaiming, Ha, I knew it, I'm smart. Sakura gave him a deadpan expression. I didn't say that. Kakashi was tiring of these shenanigans. Naruto's unstable, and he seems to have a certain sway on Sakura, even if neither of them know it. He spoke up, so, is little Sasuke gonna be joining us or not? Naruto and Sakura turned to him, both yelling, of course he is. So, Naruto turned back to face the bridge, and shouted, hey Sasuke, get your retarded ass over here. We're short of one emo freak and you're the only one in the vicinity earning a dismissive look from his sensei, and a shaking of the head from Sakura. On the far end of the bridge, Sasuke became attentive. He looked up and around, looking for the source of the screech, and quickly spotted his team at the trees. As soon as Sasuke had rushed to the team, Kakashi ordered, Now that we're all here, follow me. On the other end of the bridge, where Kakashi had taken his genin, was a path that led to more wooded areas. Though the shore was clear, each foot's length inland progressively led to more forest. The genin were led to an area close to the shore, just far enough from it that both their left and right were covered in trees. With his back to the bridge, Kakashi faced the trio to address them. Your final genin test will be quite simple all you have to do to pass is grab my bells. Silence. Sakura nervously gulped and asked, Grab your, what? Kakashi restated, my bells as he reached behind his jacket and revealed two bells tied together by a string. Oh. Kakashi continued, Now, you can only pass if you have a bell in your possession. Anyone without a bell will fail, and be sent back to the academy. Naruto pointed out, There's only two bells. Kakashi replied, Exactly. But genin teams are three genin and one sensei. Kakashi retorted, Well, the teams are gonna be resorted based on who's passed, so it'll still be three genin per sensei. No way. There was 60 kids in the team assignment room, which makes 20 teams if you take one kid out from each team, that leaves you with 40 kids, and you can't make teams of three out of that because that's an even number. Kakashi sighed. That boy ain't right. Sasuke rolled his eyes. 60's an even number, too. Sakura lamented. He's right, but his reasoning's all wrong. So, she chimed in. Sensei, three doesn't go evenly into forty Naruto's right. This test makes no sense. The man cleared his throat. We have reserves. Genin who failed get one more shot at it, so we just grab one of them. Only problem is, these Genin stay Genin they can never rank up. The kid's eyes widened. As a matter of fact, your very own Aruka sensei is one of those Genin. He's only dressed up above his rank because the Hidden Leaf has had a little trouble with the numbers of our shinobi forces what with our recent expansions. That hammered it in. Team 7 was now, more than ever, desperate to grab the bells. Immediately, Naruto pulled out a kanai and threw it at Kakashi. Kakashi promptly caught the kanai between two of his fingers and reprimanded the boy. I didn't say you could start yet. As punishment, I'll be keeping this. Not to say that I'll need it. With that, he opened his kanai pouch and placed the knife firmly with the rest of his ammo. By the way, I'm far above your level. You won't have a chance unless you come at me with the intent to kill. Anyways, we begin in 3, 2, 1. Sasuke and Sakura, having grabbed Naruto's hand, ran and leapt into a nearby bush. Naruto whined, What gives? I wanted to kill, I am. Sakura scolded, While you were busy making an ass out of yourself. Sasuke and I came up with the first part of our game plan. Naruto protested, I want to take a crack at, I am first. He created two shadow clones and jumped out of the bush, sending the clones to face Kakashi. The two copies of Naruto stared the sensei down, though the man was under the impression that one was the real Naruto, and the other was a standard illusionary clone. Kakashi complained, Really? It's gonna take more than just you and a shoddy clone to kill me. 
The clones rushed at Kakashi, forcing him into battle mode. Which one's the real one? Midas swing at the both of them and hit something solid. Kakashi stretched his hands out, and as soon as the clones were within arm's distance, he brought his hands in with a clapping motion, only to find that both entities he targeted were solid. A shadow clone. The clones both climbed onto Kakashi's arms, up to his biceps. One clone began to tank on his vest, while the other started biting it. Kakashi easily managed to throw the biting clone off, forcing it to dispel. Then, he grabbed the other one, pulled it up, and flipped it into the air. As he clone was falling, Kakashi brought his fingers together and shouted, Thousand years of death. He thrusted the clone in the anus, only for it to dispel, too. Two shadow clones. Damn that genetic ingenuity, he spun around, scanning his surroundings to find his genin. Alas, they had all disappeared. Sakura had been following Sasuke throughout the forest, pestering him about a new plan. After a few minutes of this, Sasuke made it clear that he had had enough. Let's just split up. I'm tired of listening to this drivel of yours. Though hurt, Sakura wordlessly obeyed. As Sakura continued through the forest, she saw a familiar silhouette in front of her. She walked closer to confirm her suspicions, and found that her assessment had been correct. Hey, Sasuke, funny seeing you here. She gleefully skipped towards him, noticing with every hop that something was amiss. He's bleeding. Frightened, Sakura ran closer to him, asking, What happened? Sasuke's skull was bleeding profusely, and he was covered in dirt. When Sakura reached him, she grabbed his hand. Just then, a cloud of smoke replaced him. Before Sakura now stood none other than Kakashi. The girl passed out from the shock. Sasuke walked on a beaten path, until he veered and found a clearing. It's like I'm the only one in this team who's sane. I'd run off if I didn't have to kill Itachi. He spotted Kakashi smack in the middle of the clearing, just standing and reading a book. And the bells are right there. He took small, inching steps, tiptoeing across the circle. His eyes fixated on the prize, his vision tunneling on the bronze ornaments. Sasuke stretched out his arm, ready to snatch the bells. His index finger made contact. Then his middle finger. Then his ring finger. Then his thumb. Then he brought his fingers together to actually hold the bell. But just before he could get a grip, Kakashi turned around. He yanked the boy's arm upwards, holding him above the ground like mistletoe. Kakashi jested, I thought there was a fly behind me. Instead, it's something much more pestering and much less welcome. Sasuke wasted no time, and kicked the man right in the diaphragm, on the area left without protection from the Jonin vest. This forced Kakashi to drop him, kneel, and hold his chest in pain. You damn kids and your cheap shots, you're gonna be the death of me. Sasuke attempted to run around and grab the bells, but Kakashi quickly grabbed his leg and tripped him, before rolling in the opposite direction and springing up. Sasuke grunted in frustration, he was faking the injury. The boy punched the ground and stood up. Once again, wasting no time, he began forming hand signs. Kakashi recognized the signs, and decided to fight fire with fire by making the same signs. Both shinobi formed an O with their hand in front of their lips Kakashi had to momentarily remove his mask and blew fire out their mouths. The fireballs converged in a mound of smoke, which Kakashi broke through to grab Sasuke. Sakura had woken up, and was stumbling around the forest, looking for Sasuke. That stupid Naruto, how could he just abandon us like that? She came across a clearing, and noticed a sort of bump in the area. As she got closer, chills ran up her spine. That's, a human head. She inched closer to make out the face, and was horrified to learn that it was Sasuke. Shrieking, she passed out once more. Sasuke sighed. I'm just buried under the dirt. Naruto sat atop a tree, sweat pouring down. I've got one good shot at this. If I don't do it right, that brainy freak is gonna figure it out and I won't have the bells. I can do this. He breathed deep to calm himself down, and once he felt his heart rate drop, he knew he was ready. Naruto disappeared from the tree. As Kakashi jumped around the forest, he heard a jingling behind him. That's odd. He stopped on the ground, and felt his belt for the bells. He found that they were somehow gone. What? How? Who? Kakashi turned around, trying to spot one of his genin. He checked for footprints, and found none. 
Finding it all a bit curious, he cut his thumb with a kanai, and slammed his hand on the ground. A brown pug, dressed in shinobi attire, appeared in a puff of smoke. Kakashi asked, Pakun, you smell anyone other than me here? The pug sniffed the air, and answered, Yeah, but it's strange. What's strange? There's a single spot where another person dropped their smell, but the scent doesn't go anywhere. It's like he just popped in and then vanished into thin air. Kakashi reached into his pocket and pulled out the kanai he stole from Naruto. He ordered, Smell this, tell me if it's the same scent. Pakun did as he was told, and affirmed, It's partially masked by yours, but. Yep, this is it. Kakashi responded, You can go now. Thanks. And the pug disappeared in another puff of smoke. Kakashi inspected the kanai. It can't be. He unwound the tape on its handle, and was dumbfounded by what he saw. This is. It's his jutsu. In the same tree he had disappeared from, Naruto held the bells in his hand. In and out, baby. That's what I'm talking about. He removed the flying thunder kanai from the tree. Now I wonder if I'll freak out again. Then, just like what had occurred two nights before, he began laughing maniacally. Just like the last time he performed the flying thunder, all sanity left his mind. Only now, he was armed with a kanai. He flailed it around, with no regard for what it hit or where it went, and even nearly fell out of the tree. The mental break felt as if it had gone by faster, being that it was a more familiar experience now. When he came to, he saw that he had cut up his arms by mistake. Oh great, I pulled a Sasuke. He sighed heavily, and stood up, aiming to find his teammates to show them the bells. Sasuke and Sakura walked around the forest again, Sasuke covered neck to toe in dirt, with Sakura's hands and knees covered the same. Both wore misery on their faces, lamenting their failures against Kakashi. They soon found a pond, where they washed their hands in the cold water. Sakura splashed her face, hoping to chisel some of the weariness off her face, as tiredness and hunger overtook her. As she rose, Sasuke complained, What are we even doing? Two genin up against an elite ninja. That's impossible. Sakura agreed. Yeah, it's really weird. It's like he doesn't want us to actually get the bells. The genin's eyes widened, as they both shared their revelation simultaneously. This is a teamwork exercise. Sakura explained, it was so obvious. The greatest core tenet of a genin team is to work with each other in harsh conditions and by giving us only two bells to chase, sensei gives us incentive to work against each other, forcing us to follow the core tenet even at our own detriment. Sasuke chuckled, and commanded, let's find Naruto and get this done. Yet, it was Naruto who found his teammates, he stumbled up to the pond, singing, look what I've got, as he flashed the bells to them. Sakura's eye twitched, she informed, Naruto, we were supposed to work together to get them. Naruto stammered, oh well, uh, we can just lie to sensei and tell him that you guys came up with the plan. Sasuke responded, whoa whoa whoa, how do you even get the bells? The test was designed to be impossible. Naruto recoiled. Well, I'm gonna need you guys to keep a pretty big secret. Sakura asked, What's the secret? The blonde admitted, It's a long story, but. The bottom line is that I've learned a mock teleportation technique that I used to nab these things and vanish. Sasuke scoffed. No way, dumbass. Show us. Naruto squirmed, I. Can't really do that. It's embarrassing. Sasuke pressed, embarrassing. Just show us the damn technique if you're telling the truth. Sakura butted in, just forget it already. If he doesn't want to show us, he doesn't have to. Right now, we just need to figure out a way to trick Kakashi Sensei, to make him really believe we all made the plan together. Naruto questioned, how come? Can't we just tell, I am and be done with it? Sakura answered, because he's gonna ask us how we dealt with the issue of splitting the bells. Two bells, three genin. We have to make him think we worked it out as a team. Naruto groaned, damn that sensei, he's always toying with people. Sasuke admonished, complaining about it won't help. He kicked rocks as Sakura ignored him. The only way for all of us to pass is if each of us is willing to fail to let the others pass as a demonstration of our care for our team. Naruto hesitantly suggested, if that's the case, we should. We should. I'll try and take the fall, and tell, I am we'd rather all fail than succeed at the detriment of our teammates. Sasuke scoffed. That's crazy. Sakura nervously gulped. 
It is crazy, but it's just crazy enough to work. Oh, man. Kakashi decided to recuperate at the beginning of the testing site. Fortunately, the genin had the same idea. Kakashi spoke first. All right, I know Naruto grabbed the bells. Who did he give the other one to? Sakura took charge. Actually, Sensei, Naruto offered to give it to both me and Sasuke. After a few minutes of circular arguing, we decided that neither of us was willing to let another fail. So we're all failing. She tossed the bells to him. Naruto asked, Hey, how do you know I was the one who took the bells? Kakashi answered, You were sloppy, Naruto. I used one of my tracking dogs to match the smell of the kanai I took from you to the smell you left when you nabbed the bells. And upon examination of the kanai, I figured out exactly what technique you used. So, not only have you let your enemy figure out your greatest jutsu, you've also forfeited the mission by handing the bells back to me. This test has been a failure all around I'm disappointed. The genin thought Kakashi would congratulate them on their teamwork and care, but it wasn't happening. Sasuke was about to pipe up, but Naruto pinched him and whispered, remember, he might be messing with us. Kakashi ordered, all right, follow me, planes. Kakashi led his team to a plain area, slightly elevated, surrounded by forest in the manner that a peninsula is surrounded by water the shape resembled a ping pong paddle, with the handle leading to the path they approached from. Kakashi sat his genin some stumps a few feet apart to use as seats, placing Sakura in the middle with the boys at both sides, removing lunchboxes from a fourth stump to hand to them all. He told them, you must be hungry. Stay here and eat these while I go and tell the Hokage you failed. The genin felt their anxiety skyrocket, is he really gonna fail us all? They exchanged nervous glances, and shakily opened their boxes to eat the lunch. With that, Kakashi turned around and began to walk down the path. Once he was out of earshot, Sakura insisted to the boys through her teeth, just hold on, guys. He's bluffing. He's gotta be. Sasuke's breathing began to go shallow, unless we've severely overthought this. Naruto shook his head. This is some great food. Wonder if he cooked it himself. I need the recipe. Sasuke and Sakura looked at him in perplexity. Sakura asked, Really? We've gambled our careers as genin and you're worried about the rice? Naruto wistfully smiled. Nah, I just remembered. We're supposed to only fear God, you know. Whatever he lets happen, happens. No point worrying ourselves to death. Sakura hummed in agreement. You sound like the preacher at my monastery, but you're right. All we can do is wait and see what God wills. Sasuke scoffed. God's will. Tell me. What kind of god would let me watch helplessly as my parents' throats were slit? It's all bullshit. Sakura went silent. Naruto dismissively replied, Man. Even if I told you, you wouldn't get it. Forget I even mentioned him. The genin ate their lunches in silence. After a while, Naruto stated, All right, I'm tapping out. I had a big breakfast, you know. He offered, Either one oh you want quarter eaten lunch? I promise I haven't been sloppy or anything. Sakura accepted. You know what, I'm hungry. Hand it over, Dweebus. Hokage's office a line of John and Sensei stood in the room, barking out their team's status. The Hokage asked, Team 8, Kuranai. A woman with long brown hair and striking red eyes answered, Pass. Very well. Team 10? Asuma stepped forward. Pass. Good, my son, good. That just leaves Team. 7. Where is Kakashi? Kuranai jested, late as always. Sometimes I wonder if he even showed up on time for his own birth. Just then, however, Kakashi stepped in. Asuma joked, speak of the devil. Kakashi announced, I'll have you know, Kuranai, I was born a year late. Kuranai rolled her eyes. Knowing him, that's not even a joke. The Hokage inquired, Kakashi, what of Team 7? When Kakashi returned to Team 7, he noticed that they were engaged in conversation. As such, he announced his presence with a loud, A-T-T-E-N-T-E-N. The genin stopped talking to give him confused glances. Sakura spoke, This isn't the army, sensei. Kakashi responded, Yeah, yeah, I know. But I thought you'd be interested in the gifts I have to offer. Now intrigued, the genin stared at him with wide eyes. Naruto eagerly asked, what gifts? Kakashi revealed three blue headbands, with metal plates bearing the hidden leaf symbol screwed in. You've all passed. Congratulations. 
The kids swarmed Kakashi, but he withheld the headbands for a moment. He commanded, First, I need you to remember something. A shinobi who abandons his orders is no shinobi at all, whereas a shinobi who abandons his comrades is scum. Repeat that for me. The genin repeated, A shinobi who abandons his orders is no shinobi at all, whereas a shinobi who abandons his comrades is scum. Kakashi smiled, and handed them all their headbands, which they excitedly placed on their foreheads and tightened. Pride in their achievement fueled their joy, as each genin beamed. Kakashi told them, From now on, every Monday through Friday, we'll meet at the Namikaze Bridge as our rendezvous point, at 8 a.m. sharp. He then added, Now let's start off on a good foot, one that shows you can TTUS me from now on. The genin were all ears as he spoke. For starters, the whole thing about reserve genin was a lie. At least, failed genin don't work the way I said they do. And your buddy Iruka Sensei is definitely a chunin. Team 7 breathed sighs of relief. Thank God. Kakashi continued, Now, when I encountered Naruto in this test, he performed two techniques that no other genin knows. Naruto was puzzled. Two? I thought it was just the one? Kakashi chortle. Nope, when you sent your clones to attack me, I noticed that they were, with no doubt, shadow clones. Naruto was bewildered. Shadow clones? But, but, Sakura, you made the diagram I used to do it. He stared at the stupefied girl in amazement. Kakashi smiled. Well, it looks like Sakura has inadvertently taught you that the shadow clone technique an advanced form of the clone technique, which creates solid clones that have a stronger neural link to the technician. While Naruto and Sakura stood there, mouth agape, Sasuke asked, So, what's the other jutsu? Kakashi smiled again. It's not my secret to tell. Naruto will explain, if he's comfortable with it. Naruto stammered. Oh oh. Uh. Yeah, so that other technique is the, uh, flying thunder, made by the fourth Hokage. Last night I was tricked into stealing a scroll that contained it, and I read it. I'm pretty sure it's beyond my level to perform consistently, but I'm able to perform it well enough to go back and forth between two places in a short amount of time. Kakashi winked, thought it looked like he blinked. It's just one bombshell after another today, isn't it? With that, he turned around and began to walk away. However, before leaving earshot, he stated, By the way, I know you three were lying about coming up with the plan to snatch the bells together. Late afternoon, public footpath Sakura sat on a bench, internally fuming. With her eyes closed and her head held back, she rocked her legs back and forth. I can't believe Naruto would be so stupid. Tricked so easily. Stealing a scroll from the Hokage, not coming to me for help. Stupid, stupid, stupid. An hour ago, she had admonished Naruto and stormed off from the testing site. What was it I called him again? Careless, short sighted, rash, naive, and dim witted. I hope he's okay after all that. Actually, no, he should feel bad. He has no regard for his own safety. HMPH. She sighed in frustration. But then again, if he hadn't, would he have gotten the bells? Not like we needed them to pass. So, if he hadn't let himself get fooled like that, if he hadn't learned that jutsu, and if he had just listened to me and Sasuke, we would have passed anyways. But even if he did learn the jutsu, why didn't he stick with me and Sasuke? He really is rash. She leaned forward, hands on her knees, looking down. I guess it was pretty sweet of him to get the bells for all of us, though. And he did tell us he didn't want us to see what happens when he does that technique, while I was storming off. What could be so terrible? He sounded like he was afraid. She blinked wistfully. Whatever. Just try to distract yourself, Haruno. Think non Naruto thoughts. Comfort yourself. As such, the girl attempted to clear her mind as a form of distressing. Just imagine, if Sasuke were to show up and say something like, I don't know, you have a noble brow, I just want to kiss it. Elation ran over her as her vivid imagination provided a sense of relief. Just then, someone approached her. Feeling the presence, she opened her eyes and looked up to see none other than Sasuke standing in front of her. Nonchalantly, he stated, You have a noble brow, I just want to kiss it. Just kidding. Doesn't that sound more like something Naruto would say? Sakura pouted. Now that I think about it, it really does. Sakura asked, Hey, Sasuke. What's up? I want to talk. Scoot over, please. Sure. Sakura moved over, allowing Sasuke to take a seat beside her. Strangely enough, 
Sasuke seemed nervous. He was silent, and just stared at Sakura, as if he were scanning her. Sakura coughed. You wanted to talk? Sasuke stammered, why yeah. I was wondering. What's your opinion of Naruto? My. Opinion. Yeah. What comes to mind when you think of him? What do you think about his personality? Sakura cleared her throat. Well, I think he's a little careless. I get the feeling that he takes advantage of the fact that he's an orphan to engage in shenanigans. W what sort of shenanigans? You know, like defiling the Hokage monument. Yeah, that was pretty dumb, I guess. Dropping that eraser on Sensei's head. I mean, that was funny, though, you even laughed at it. How about disguising himself as someone else to get my opinion of him, when he could just ask me outright? Sasuke stuttered. WHWH what does that mean? Sakura rolled her eyes. I know it's you, Naruto. Give up the act already. Sasuke, sighed. With a puff of smoke, he revealed himself to truly be Naruto, cheeks red with embarrassment. With a downtrodden expression, he asked, what gave it away? Sakura replied, plenty of things, like the fact that Sasuke was asleep when you pranked Sensei. Besides, the thing about liking my forehead. Sasuke would never say anything like that. Other than that, you still had the whole accent thing going on. Naruto was taken aback. A accent? Yeah, accent. You sound like a kid version of, the man with no name. Who? It's a guy from some old westerns, I'll show you later. But I digress. I'm sure even you could have figured out by now that I wasn't being serious about the whole, taking advantage of being an orphan, thing. Naruto didn't respond. Sakura pressed further, concerned. You did know I wasn't being serious, right? Naruto sheepishly turned away, looked down, and began to twiddle his thumbs. Well. No, not really. I was ready to accept it, though. I am kinda annoying, and I probably wouldn't be so troublesome if I had parents. Sakura reluctantly put a hand on his shoulder, shifted closer, and told him, H hey, I know you can be kinda annoying, but you're not some ominous little orphan boy. Naruto interjected, who said anything about me being ominous? The girl squeezed his shoulder and spoke through gritted teeth, that's not the point here. Naruto straightened himself up in an attempt to recoup his confidence. Then. What is the point? Sakura sighed. The point is that you're not as bad as you think I think you are. I. Huh? Look, you have this idea of how bad I think you are, right? Yeah. What I'm saying is, you're not really as bad as that idea. So, what do you think of me? I don't really know. You're hardly the bane of my existence, to say the least. Okay. But that doesn't mean I like you the way you like me. Oh. Naruto slumped, looking down. Not anything I didn't know, but it still kinda hurts to hear. Sakura looked off to the side and admitted, I don't like saying this, but for a long time, I didn't have any opinion of you. Your existence was like an open secret, everyone knew you but no one knew you personally and I certainly didn't know you, so I didn't want to form a baseless opinion. Then I met you, and I thought you were some sort of ne'er-do-well, you know? Sakura turned back to Naruto and glared at him. She sternly ordered, look at me, loser. With timid eyes, Naruto obeyed, meeting her gaze. When Aruka sensei suggested that I tutor you, I was peeved. I really only took him up on the offer because he promised extra credit but and I'll snap your neck if you tell anyone I've warmed up to you since then. Excitement overtook Naruto. His eyes widened as he formed a hungry smile. He pushed himself up to kneel on the bench as he leaned in to Sakura. He jabbered, really really really? You mean it? Sakura chuckled, yeah, yeah, bask in your glory. Then, she ruffled his hair promptly calming him down while softly telling him, and I appreciate what you said about my forehead. It was really sweet. As she let her arm down, Naruto scooted forward, grabbing a hold of it. He swore to her, I meant every word, in fact, I like everything about you, more than anyone else. Now blushing, Sakura gently removed his grip on her arm, stating, that's really flattering. She then demanded, that line about my forehead, say it again, as yourself this time. Naruto froze up. He choked, w well, I I just it's not easy. Just look me in the eyes and say it already, Naruto obeyed and squirmed. Okay 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 okay. You have a noble brow, I'd really like to kiss it. That wasn't so bad. Sakura stood up, telling Naruto, I'm gonna go home now, but before I do. 
She cupped a single hand under his chin to turn his face, priming him for the soft peck she landed on his cheek, leaving him completely dumbfounded. She noticed his attention fixed on her, and sang, I'll kill you if you tell anyone, as she began her walk home. Wealthy urban district Sasuke approached a lavish, pristine, luxury, glass apartment building, a symbol of the hidden leafs particularly, the Uchiha and certain other elite clans' great wealth. Passing through the district were people not just on foot, but also in wagons operating on motors. Such was the abundance of wealth in Sasuke's home of the past few years. The building had a vast plaza, with a fountain in the middle, whose centerpiece was a stone bust of the Uchiha clan symbol. The names of victims of the Uchiha massacre, such that each day begin with their names in the light of the sun, were plated on the eastern side of the fountain, facing away from the complex. Sasuke hated it. Every time he saw it, it was just a reminder of what he had lost, that so many others had been permitted to keep his family. Sure, the massacre hadn't even made the slightest dent in the clan's numbers, but Sasuke lamented each and every day that his parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, and friends were the ones who had lost their lives, and that it as far as anyone knew his elder brother's hand. Every time he saw the memorial, he forsook the Lord, wishing it had been someone else's family and someone else's friends. He had even turned to God in supplication, praying that somehow his family and friends would return, or even just his parents at the very least. Nonetheless, no such thing ever happened. According to Sasuke, because God had it out for him, or didn't exist. Either one was a fine enough, albeit poor, filling for Sasuke's attempts at apathy towards God. Being that he so despised that memorial, as well as the occasional swarm of journalists and paparazzi, Sasuke had chosen the back door as his preferred method of entry. He made a beeline from the entrance to the elevator. He stuck a key in the hole above the buttons, sending him up to the top floor, the penthouse. As the elevator doors opened, Sasuke walked in and was greeted by his legal guardian, Shisui Uchiha, one of the most reputable Uchiha also one of the only capable Uchiha in the shinobi ranks. Good afternoon, Sasuke. How'd your test go? Sasuke whined. My teammates are annoying and my sensei's a bastard. Better than I expected. Go take a shower and we'll hang out or something. I'm making your favorite for dinner. Suburban area. Sakura's house Sakura skipped to the front steps of her house a two-story home with ample room for her family, and then some. She used her heart-shaped key to open the door, walking in with a cheery greeting of, I'm home, as she removed her shoes. Immediately, Sakura's mother, Mebuki a slim woman who almost resembled her, if not for the thinner jawline and short wavy hair hopped over to meet her. There you are, princess. She joked, daddy's not home now, you're stuck with me and Haruto. Sakura chortled, I'm gonna take a shower, don't wait up. As Sakura sprinted up the stairs, Mebuki shouted, and when you come back, tell us how the test went, darling. Naruto's apartment when Naruto arrived, he yelled, yo Anko, I'm back. To which Anko replied, come on, Naruto, join the fun. Naruto kicked off his shoes and ran to the living room to see what Anko was talking about. To his horror, she was playing just dance with Kakashi. Naruto complained, first you mount Anko, now you invade our home. Where does the insanity end, sensei? Not breaking away from the dance, Kakashi answered, I wasn't aware of the notion that it should end. I don't even know when it began. Naruto grumbled. Ak, fine, whatever. But can you just tell me how you got to the point of banging Anko? It doesn't make sense to me. Kakashi responded, you know the movie, When Harry Met Sally. Yeah, she's Harry, I'm Sally, Naruto sighed. I'm gonna have to choke a straight answer out of him, aren't I? He shifted his attention to Anko, commanding, Anko, I need your help with something. Still dancing, Anko replied, not now, kid, I haven't kicked Kakashi's ass all the way yet. Rather than wait, however, Naruto decided to act on his impatience. He stomped over to Anko, grabbed her arm, and skirmished into his room with her in tow. After getting in, he shouted to Kakashi, don't even think about listening in, creep, before slamming the door shut. Anko asked, All right, Naruto, what's so damn urgent? Naruto told her, I need advice, for a girl. Anko smirked, Do ya now? All right, I'm all ears. So, what does it mean if a girl says she'll snap my neck if I tell anyone she doesn't hate me? The smirk disappeared as Anko asked, What? What does it mean if? I heard you the first time. 
why did she say that? She also said she'd kill me if I told anyone she kissed me on the cheek. She's a weird girl. Naruto objected, hey, Sakura's not weird. Anko snapped, first of all, she definitely is. Secondly, now she has to snap your neck. Third, it's your classmate Sakura that you're talking about? Isn't she hung up on emo boy? Naruto murmured, don't tell her I said anything, please. And yeah, she's hung up on emo boy, as far as I know. Anko sighed. All right, here's my advice. Be assertive. Assertive. Next time you see her, tell her, listen, girl, I won't play these games with you. If you really like me at all, you have to promise that you won't snap my neck and or kill me. That should get the ball rolling. Really? Yes. Really. Now let me get back to fooling around with Kakashi. Please don't phrase it like that. Sakura's house, evening. Sakura's father a slick businessman, named Kazashi, with a goatee, and his hair now down to his shoulders walked down the stairs in a t-shirt and sweatpants, having taken a post-work shower. He noticed that his wife and daughter dressed pretty much the same way gestured for him to enter the dining room. Walking towards them, he peeked in the living room to spot his eight-year-old son watching TV, before joking to the girls, are we having an early dinner? Mebuki replied, you wish. No, Sakura just wants some advice about a certain boy. Now standing with the girls, Kazashi asked, the troublemaker or the emo? Sakura rolled her eyes, it's Naruto. Her father snickered, well, I prefer that one anyways. Sakura cleared her throat. Now let's get to the issue at hand. Mebuki told her, we're all ears. The girl informed, well, it's just that Naruto gave me a really sweet compliment today. He said that my brow's noble and that he wants to kiss it. Mebuki interjected, I didn't think he'd be so forward. Kazashi asked, well, Sakura, how did that make you feel? Sakura answered, it felt really nice. I was all warm and fuzzy inside, but it's Naruto. Kazashi advised, say that again, but leave out that last part. Sakura restated, it felt really nice, I was all warm and fuzzy inside. Kazashi suggested, isn't that all that matters? In spite of how averse you've been to connect to that kid, you feel good around him. Act on that. Mebuki admitted, your father and I were the same way, really. I couldn't stand him at first, but he won me over with his own special brand of charisma. The buttery smooth voice didn't hurt, either. Sakura smiled. His voice? That gives me an idea. She excused, thanks, mommy, thanks daddy, I'm gonna go and invite Naruto here then. The adults watched as Sakura went over to the home phone in the living room and called Naruto. Yeah, Naruto, it's me. I was thinking, if you don't have anything to do, you could come over. Yeah I know we don't have to study anything anymore, I'm just inviting you as a, well, as a social thing. We can watch one of those westerns I was talking about, with, the man with no name. Yeah, you can come now, that works fine. Join us for dinner, too. Alright, see you soon, bye. I hope I don't regret this. When Naruto arrived, he was dressed in a plain white shirt and black shorts a bold choice for the increasingly cold hidden leaf nights. He was welcomed warmly, as Sakura and her family had grown accustomed to his presence. As he took off his shoes and stepped into the living room, he asked, Hey, Sakura, can we talk privately real quick? Sakura replied, WH yeah, sure. What is it? Naruto asked, You wouldn't really snap my neck or kill me, would ya? Sakura answered with her own question, did you tell anyone about our conversation? Naruto closed his eyes and begged, just my caretaker, and by accident, please don't hurt me. Sakura responded, I was joking, Naruto. I'm not crazy enough to kill you, you know. Oh oh? All right, then. So, what's the movie we're gonna watch? Sakura answered, for a few dollars more, the guy the first was talking about is the main character. By the way, his nickname's actually Blondie in the third movie, so that's just another way that you're like him, hey. Naruto pouted. Yeah, okay. Thus, Naruto, Sakura, and her family plopped onto the couch to watch the two-hour film. To Sakura's surprise, her disdain for Naruto proved to be no issue. As a matter of fact, it hadn't even crossed her mind. For once, she was having unabashed, unequivocal fun with Naruto. At one point, their hands had even touched as they both reached for popcorn at the same time, eliciting quickened apologies, though neither one really minded. All in all, Sakura felt like she could accept being more comfortable around Naruto. 
the source of her insecurities seemed to become alien for the time. Namikaze Bridge, the next day to the surprise of both Naruto and Sakura, Kakashi was early for their meeting the man was waiting for them as they arrived. They had noticed that he was lost in a book, but stayed standing in a single spot, as if he were a statue. The genin decided to approach their sensei. Upon seeing the book Kakashi was reading, both Naruto and Sakura shouted, pervert. It was a smut novel, titled, The Thoroughest Examination, by famed pervert author, Jiraiya. Kakashi nonchalantly eyed his students and said, reading's good for the soul. Sakura snapped back, well, I read that those kinds of books destroy your mind, so, and stuck her fingers in her ears as she stuck her tongue out at Kakashi and raspberried him. Naruto added, yeah, what she said, Kakashi sighed, closing his smut as Sakura finished taunting him. He informed, all right, now as soon as Sasuke gets here, we're going to take our first mission as Team 7. Naruto jumped up and down. Oh boy, missions. Kakashi added, E-rank missions. Just stuff like sowing seeds and finding lost pets. We're not even stopping crimes. Naruto deflated. Oh. Lame. Just then, Sasuke showed up to the bridge, bored and unexpressive as always. However, he also let the slightest gasp slip when he saw Kakashi not giving his team the runaround for once. Sakura automatically blushed as a result of her infatuation with him, but felt her stomach churn at the same time. Why does Sasuke always make me feel so weird? An hour later Naruto spoke through a radio, target in sight. I repeat, target in sight. Next course of action, team leader. Over. Sasuke responded first, saying, Stop talking like a dope, dope. Kakashi ignored this, answering Naruto, We have the element of surprise. Wait for us to get into prime position. As he, Sasuke, and Sakura attempted to get a good vantage point over their target, they suddenly heard Naruto shouting in their earpieces. Got ya. Ya little o. No, you don't. Y-E-O-U-C-H. Just stay still. They ran towards him, finding that he had subdued the target. Naruto told them, one minister's wife's cat, as ordered. He flaunted the black cat in his arms, which was making a grumpy face, having failed to escape his clutches. Kakashi scolded, I told you to wait, Naruto. Naruto argued, I was gonna wait, promise. But the cat started getting suspicious of me, so I had to act fast. Kakashi relented, all right, I'll accept it. Let's take this thing back to the Hokage's office, now. Hokage's office team 7 and the Hokage watched as a now disheveled Naruto handed the cat over to a plump lady. The lady, the minister's wife, sang, Oh thank you, my sweet little snookums couldn't ever survive in the harsh wilderness of the village. Naruto sarcastically replied, Oh yeah, it's not like cats are natural predators or anything. The fire lord's wife responded, Well, not my snookums. He's a precious little baby who's only meant for the luxuries of domestic life. Naruto eyed her up and down, and joked, he clearly isn't the only one. With that, the lady left the office. The Hokage commended the team. Good job, Team 7. Here is your pay for the mission. Kakashi received an envelope. He ripped it open, revealing a huge wad of cash. Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke were all starry-eyed. That's a small fortune. As he flipped through the cash, Kakashi informed, the minister's wife gets real worried about her snookums. We were lucky to get this mission. He then removed half of the money, placing it back in the envelope. That's my cut. I am team leader, after all. The Hokage chuckled. Kakashi then removed half of what was remaining, and gave it to Naruto. For your trouble, he stated. Naruto frantically took the money and placed it in his trusty frog wallet making his team snicker at the childish thing. Kakashi then split the rest of the money evenly between Sakura and Sasuke. Sasuke complained, how come we're making so little? Kakashi told him, if you want to earn more, you gotta be more proactive. One week later Team 7 stood at the clear path beside their rendezvous bridge, facing a set of tall trees. Kakashi told his genin, today's lesson, walking on walls. He nonchalantly approached a tree, and without missing a beat, walked up its side as if it were even ground. He continued walking until he encountered a branch in his way, and he opted to walk into that branch as well, now hanging upside down from it. He asked, anyone know how that's done? Sakura volunteered. She explained, it's obvious. 
you simply have to regulate your body's chakra to balance the chakra in your feet with the surface you intend to walk on. Kakashi challenged, then do it. Sakura deflated. I. I've never tried it before. Kakashi chuckled. I've never tried hanging upside down before, but here I am. Try it quick, before there's no more blood in my legs. Naruto urged, Come on, Sakura, I know you can do it. Sakura replied, If you insist. She skipped over to an adjacent tree, stopping short of touching it in her hesitancy. With a prayer, she slowly brought up the first foot to tread her right foot, as she had been taught it to be proper while concentrating the proper amount of chakra into her souls. God, I hope I get this right. Voila her foot attached to the tree as if it were solid ground. She brought up her other foot in the same manner, with the same result. Step by step, she walked ten feet up the tree, and then, Thud Sakura landed in a pratfall on the ground. Kakashi lightly remarked, Oh yeah, did I forget to tell you? It's not a pleasant drop. Sakura sarcastically replied, Yeah, thanks for telling me. Kakashi facetiously answered, You're welcome. Naruto decided to try his hand at tree walking. He ran towards a tree, brought his foot up to it, and only found himself shoved back. Kakashi dropped to the ground, stopped him from falling, and announced, that's what happens when you use too much chakra. He watched as Sasuke attempted the same maneuver, only to fail to latch onto the tree. He told him, that's what happens when you use too little. Sakura, now sitting twenty feet up on a tree branch, called out, Naruto, Sasuke, what's up? I am, and stuck her tongue out at them. The boys dedicated themselves to walking up their respective trees. After a few minutes, Naruto approached Sakura, who was sitting at the base of her tree. He asked, Hey, Sakura, can I get some help, please? She answered, What? Yeah, sure. The boy kneeled down and whispered, How'd I walk up a tree? Don't let Sasuke hear. Sakura, in turn, giggled. She whispered back into Naruto's ear as he nodded and grinned. Hours later Sakura, with her headband concealed, walked along a sidewalk in the dead of night. She was holding a large, expensive purse, waving it around as if she were showing it off. Just as she walked past a street lamp, two men on a motorcycle passed by at a slow speed. The motorcycle was a barebones vehicle, with its singular seat being a broad strip of leather, no place to rest the feet, nor obedience to bicycles' rules of steering, instead using triggers on the handlebars to turn. A man jumped off the back while the other continued driving at pace. The man who jumped off attempted to snatch the purse from Sakura, who resisted. All the while, the man on the motorcycle continued at pace down the street. Sakura demanded, It isn't yours, give it back. As the thief barked, Just hand it over, bitch. He then pushed her down onto the ground, though she saved herself from a major injury by guarding her head. She whispered, All right, Sasuke, get ready. As the thief approached the corner of the street, he suddenly tripped. Sasuke was hiding behind the building, and brought out his leg to apprehend the man. He quickly leapt onto his back tying his hands, as the man shouted to his accomplice, Get out of here, save yourself. The man on the motorcycle sped up, tripling his speed to escape the genin. Unbeknownst to him, a kanai passed above his head. Out of nowhere, Naruto appeared behind the cyclist, pulling on his shoulders. The cyclist thrust the brakes, sending the motorcycle to a screeching halt, as both he and Naruto fell on the ground. Naruto quickly summoned a dozen clones, one of which helped him tie down the cyclist, while the others stopped the motorcycle from sliding too far. Naruto and the cyclist landed directly under a street lamp, as the rest of Team 7 came by. Kakashi picked up the cyclist and ordered, Sasuke, we'll take these guys to the station. As they began to drag the men, Kakashi noticed that Naruto hadn't gotten up. Concerned, he gestured to Sakura, who walked over to Naruto. She kneeled down and asked, Naruto, are you alright? The boy's breathing was shallow, and he was unresponsive. Upon closer inspection, Sakura noted that he was also sweating much too heavily. Attempting to stay calm, she placed her hand on his forehead, and began to panic. She shouted, he he's burning up, in this weather, in those clothes? She undid the zipper on Naruto's vest, and was about to cut his shirt off, when he suddenly jolted and woke up. Sakura nugied him. So it was all an act, was it? You had me really worried, you know. Yelping in pain, Naruto explained, Yao, NN no it wasn't an act, I swear. 
The light just started hurting me all of a sudden. Sakura pulled her hand back, and took a look at the light. She reasoned, you think it has an effect on your chakra reaction? Naruto answered, why yeah, it got in my eyes and gave me a headache, combine that with the jutsu I used. Sakura noogied him again. She scolded, and that's why we don't use techniques that are above our level. Another few weeks later, teams 7, 8, and 10 stood in the Hokage's office, sending in their first monthly reports. Being that the autumn months had arrived in an already cold year, they were all dressed in jackets or light coats, along with longer pants. Except for Naruto. He was adamant that until he really needed to, he would continue to wear his short sleeve t shirt and vest. The Jonin sensei were all betting on when that would be. The Hokage announced, It seems everything is in perfect order. You may very well be taking C rank missions within the next quarter. Naruto complained, No. I'm tired of all these menial tasks and petty crimes. I want to do a C rank now. WWWWW. The Hokage rolled his eyes. He asked, Kakashi, what say you? The addressed Jonin, in turn, asked Sakura and Sasuke, Of course, I have my own opinion, but do you guys think you're ready for a C rank? Sakura and Sasuke looked at each other for confirmation, before looking back at Kakashi and affirming, Yes, we are. Kakashi smiled, addressing the Hokage, We're ready, Lord Hokage. Hiruzen, though taken aback, pulled out a folder. I trust your instincts, Kakashi. This will be your mission. Escort Mr. Tazuna Aono to his home, the land of waves, while ensuring his goods are not damaged. Then, you will oversee the construction of a bridge he's building it's in the final stages by now. He held a button on the phone on his desk, ordering his assistant, bring Mr. Aono in, please. A few seconds later, the door to the office opened. In came an aging man, somewhere in his fifties, his unkempt graying hair, bushy goatee, lazily worn sunglasses, and plain rags gave the impression of a poorer man. He slurred, am, air, mister, cage. Naruto whispered to his team, why's he dressed like a hobo? Sakura whispered back, maybe he's trying to be Christian-like. You know, using his money on himself only for stuff he needs, using the rest for his people. Tazuna shuffled his feet across the office, and when he bothered to lift them, he brought them down with a loud, empty thud. As he approached the desk, it became apparent that he was holding two large duffel bags, along with wearing a camping backpack. Sasuke stated, he walks more like an animal than a Christian. Tazuna responded, yeah, was the difference. Though Sasuke smirked, Sakura answered, hey, it's not nice to talk about people that way just because you don't share their beliefs. Tazuna groaned. He flaunted the cross necklace he was wearing, gesturing to it without his hands. Yeah, well, hiccup I'm one o' them. What do you got to say about that? Sakura crossed her arms and pouted. She told him, I don't feel like playing these stupid little games. I've got this guy as my sensei. As she gestured to Kakashi. Naruto, feeling left out, interjected, yeah, old man. Tazuna turned back to Hiruzen, inquiring, hold on a second. Is this the team that's gonna be taking me back, ohm? The older man replied, yes, they are. Meet Kakashi Hataki, Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno, and Naruto Uzumaki. Tazuna sighed with hesitation. All right, all right, I'll take him. The next day, Hidden Leaf Wall Tazuna greeted Team 7 outside the village walls, still holding his bags from the previous day. Team 7 also had backpacks, filled with their clothing for the stay in the Land of Waves. Tazuna told the team, All right, to begin with, we'll be walking a few miles out the village, to the transport I've prepared. Naruto questioned, Transport? Tazuna replied, Ack, yeah, it's one o' them motorized carriages. The blonde perked up. A motor carriage? Really? That's so cool. I've never been in one before. Sasuke commented, I think you're the only one. Naruto responded, It's not my fault I'm poor. Besides, I'm sure Sensei hasn't been in one either. Kakashi sheepishly replied, Well. Naruto gave him puppy dog eyes and whined, Et tu, Sensei. Sakura gave Naruto a slap on the back and added, It's gonna be a ton of fun, I promise. The group had only walked a mile out from the village, when all of a sudden, chains emerged from the forest. They wrapped around Kakashi and squeezed, snapping his bones and making him fall to the ground. Sakura froze. She cried, S-sensei. Just then, 
Sasuke stepped in front of her and attacked a man who was approaching, using a boomerang to knock him out with a blow to the back of the head. Naruto also froze. Before the other attacker could do too much damage, Kakashi appeared in a blur, twisting his arm and breaking it. The dead Kakashi on the ground vanished in a puff of smoke, revealing itself to have been a shadow clone all along. Sasuke mocked Naruto, saying, What's the matter, scaredy cat? The insult brought Naruto back to his senses, as he stepped back. He shot back, nn no, I was just surprised, as all. Though he feigned stoicism, guilt overtook him underneath. Damn it. Why'd I freeze like that? What if someone actually died? What if Sakura got hurt? What kind of shinobi cowers like that? Moron. His heart sank, and tears even threatened to spill. It was then that Kakashi stated, Whoops, I think you've been poisoned, Naruto. Think we gotta take you back. Naruto looked around and saw that there was blood flowing from the back of his hand he'd been sliced. In response, he stammered, No way, I'm staying. He pulled out a kanai and stabbed his hand underneath the wound, hoping to get the poison out of his system. Sakura cried, Idiot, you could have made things worse, as she approached. However, after she cleaned the wound, and when she took out a bandage and prepared to apply it, she saw that the bleeding had already stopped. What? How? Kakashi saw it too, and unknowingly shared a thought with Naruto. That must be the Nine Tails power. Naruto chuckled, trying to cover for himself. Haha, must be a fast healer, huh? Sakura curiously replied, Well, maybe whatever clan you come from just has fast healing as their Keke Jenke. Tazuna questioned, Kek, Jenke. Sakura rolled her eyes and answered, Certain clans have a bloodline limit that provides them with abilities others don't have. The Uchiha have the Sharingan, the Hyuga have the Byakugan, etc. The old man joked, What kind of nerd says, etc. era, out loud? Sakura stuck her tongue out at him. Kakashi sighed. He looked at the attackers who he'd been tying up and explained, These guys are the Demon Brothers of the East Coast, a B rank rogue ninja team. Tazuna nervously gulped, well, what do they want with you? Kakashi furrowed his brow. It's not us they were after. There's no advantage to these guys, neither does it fit their MO nor intelligence, to attack an unremarkable genin team. Naruto and Sakura whined, hey. Kakashi ignored them. He walked up to Tazuna and said, they were after you, weren't they, Tazuna? Tazuna stammered, but quickly figured he had no choice but to confess. He told the team, I had to buy materials, didn't have enough money left to pay for an A rank. Kakashi grabbed Tazuna by the collar and lifted him up. He demanded, explain, before I hurt you. Tazuna obeyed. As you know, my company is building a bridge in the Land of Waves. But we're ruled by a damn oligarch. The Land of Waves used to be a prosperous sovereign land, but then Gato bought out our politicians, and took the helm for himself. He's been brutalizing our people for years and the bridge I'm building in collaboration with the Land of Tea is the wave's path to escape Gato's clutches. Kakashi dropped Tazuna, letting him pratfall. The younger man looked at the sky in deep thought, before turning back to his team. He asked, This mission just got upgraded to an A rank, and it may go higher. We're sure to come across guys more dangerous than these clowns. Do you guys want to keep going? Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke all looked at each other, communicating through eye contact alone. They looked back at Kakashi and stated, Yes, Sensei. Tazuna breathed a sigh of relief. Within the next 20 minutes, the group reached their first stop. At this point, the dirt road was blocked off with a short steel concrete barrier, giving way to a paved asphalt road on the other side. On the left and right ends of the road were short lines of black closed top wheeled carriages, with engines in front to power them. Tazuna led Team 7 to one of these carriages, using a key to unlock the trunk in which the group proceeded to place their bags. Then, Tazuna walked to the right side and swung a door open, allowing the genin to enter the back seats. Sakura entered first, and Naruto was about to jump in, but Sasuke stopped him, saying, I get motion sickness. I need to sit in the middle, for balance. Naruto argued, I don't care, throw up out the window. This prompted Sakura to admonish, don't be an idiot. Besides, a window seat is better than the middle. Naruto whimpered and whined, oh, fine, and decided he would let Sasuke sit in the middle without issue. However, rather than immediately enter the vehicle, 
Sasuke walked back around to the trunk and pulled out a thermos. Walking into the back seat now, he explained, it has ginger in it. Helps alleviate motion sickness. Naruto muttered, asshole. As Naruto stepped into the vehicle, he shut the door. The genin then waited as Tazuna opened the hood, cranked the engine, started the car, and closed the hood again before stepping into the passenger seat, with Kakashi driving. Though Naruto would have preferred to sit next to Sakura, he was still enjoying the ride. It's so oddly. Relaxing. It's crazy how everything looks like it's passing slow out one window, but when I look out the other one, everything looks fast. And the little bumps and waves almost feel like a small roller coaster. I've been missing out. He verbally expressed his joy, speaking across the car, Hey, Sakura, you were right this is fun. Sakura replied, I know, right? How about you, Sasuke? She turned to face the Uchiha, but he was clearly sick. His skin looked pale and greenish, and he was swaying back and forth. The boy placed a firm hand on Naruto's shoulder, begging, get me near the window. I need fresh air. Naruto complained, oh, so now you don't want to sit in the middle? Sasuke put his hand over his mouth and grunted, just move, dumbass. Naruto planted his feet. No, Sakura groaned, and grabbed Naruto's forearm. She yanked him up, giving Sasuke space to scoot over, and pulled the blonde into the middle. As Sasuke opened the window and hyperventilated, Naruto preoccupied himself with Sakura. He pushed himself against her, getting a view of the outside through her window, inadvertently squishing her face onto it. Sakura struggled against him, and escaped. She grabbed his head, and pushed it down below her chin, then locked him in place by keeping her arm around his neck, all the while forcing him to slouch so his feet would still be touching the floor. This gave Naruto a view of the window without crushing Sakura. Naruto cleared his throat and sheepishly told her, thanks. To which she gritted through her teeth, it's, my, pleasure. Mid-afternoon the group reached another car station, where Tazuna returned the vehicle he had rented. Following this, they hopped aboard a boat. It was small, but just big enough to fit all of them in their bags. Sasuke faced a similar motion sickness issue, which was exacerbated by the harsh, near-freezing weather. Albeit reluctantly, Sakura clutched onto Naruto to share body heat. Naruto made no protest, as he was beginning to feel tired, and he actually liked being this close to her. Though Naruto tried to resist, his breathing slowly waned. The days. Not. Over. Must. Stay awake. Naruto's plans, however, went under further assault when Sakura squeezed him tighter to close any space between them, and fully take advantage of the body heat. That being the final straw, Naruto burrowed himself into Sakura's neck and fell asleep right there on her shoulder, an inadvertent effect of her actions. No skin off my back, he's really warm. I'd almost say he's cute like this. She commented, it's so foggy and cold all of a sudden, what is this? Tazuna whispered, I, it shouldn't be this cold here yet. Must be some anomaly we've not detected. Chills began to run up his spine a feeling he was sure wasn't just due to the cold. The fog laid thick, making it harder to breathe, as if they were atop a mountain. Kakashi stayed silent, and simply rowed the boat on. When the boat finally reached the desired shore, Kakashi quietly ordered, all right, let's get up. Something's odd. This is a heavily wooded area we're going to walk past, but the first hundred feet of land are like a barren ramp. Tazuna and Sasuke followed, while Sakura had to wake up Naruto. She gently rocked him, whispering loudly, Naruto, wake up. It didn't work. She tried shaking him, but that didn't work either. She tried slapping him, but even that didn't work. In the end, she resolved to carry him on her back he had gained some weight, but was still unusually thin for his age. So, while Kakashi carried Sakura's and Naruto's bags, Sakura held Naruto, piggybacking him across the path. However, before they could even make it 50 yards inland, Naruto was stabbed in the shoulder with a kunai. The force made him fall forward, taking Sakura down under him. Fortunately, it had also woken him up. He stumbled upwards, pulling the kunai out of his shoulder, but was suddenly knocked down by Sakura. She had just saved him from being decapitated via giant shuriken. The wound on Naruto's shoulder quickly healed, as he sat and saw that Kakashi was standing in front of the group, guarding them. The entire group was ready to fight, as the genin quickly formed around Tazuna to protect him, brandishing their kunai. As a part of the fog cleared, 
a shadowy figure made itself present, stepping forward to reveal its form. It was a darker man, though his skin was pale. His hair was short, black, and unkempt. Perhaps the most noticeable thing about him was that he had wrapped himself like a mummy on his torso, bringing the bandage around the top of his head to form a mask over his mouth and nose. Besides that, a massive sword in his hand, almost resembling an oversized kitchen knife, was stepped to his back, and he wore a forehead protector with three lines crossed out. Kakashi was hit with flashbacks of the past hour. The sudden cold, the damp air, the fog. It all makes sense now, but something still feels off. He tried to conceal his anger. I should have known on the boat. Zabuza of the hidden mist. He pushed up his headband, bringing it evenly around his forehead, revealing that the iris of his hidden eye was red, with black comma like marks circling his pupil. Zabuza replied, Kakashi of the Sharingan eye. I have no quarrel with you, I just want the bridge builder. Step aside. Kakashi refused. A shinobi is loyal to his village. I've sworn to the Hokage that this man will reach his home safely. Zabuza scoffed. I remember when I was that naive. Still stuck in the ways of blind patriotism, you're no better than a child who believes in fairy tales. Without warning, Kakashi ran towards the man, before disappearing in a puff of smoke followed by water, as he reappeared behind Zabuza, with a kanai at his neck. He warned, this is the end of the line, Zabuza. Zabuza chuckled. Funny. I was gonna say the same to you. Just then, the dirt up to the point where Zabuza stood sunk, giving way for water to rise from below. Simultaneously, Kakashi tripped, and found himself trapped in a water bubble, facing Zabuza's hand. Zabuza smirked. Water prison jutsu, you fell for it. Kakashi's eyes widened. He was keeping the water hidden under the dirt. But for how long? Never mind that. I need to save my team. Kakashi yelled into his radio, get out of here, take Tazuna home, just leave. Sakura and Sasuke were terrified, but Naruto stood resolute. He defiantly responded on the radio, hell no. Kakashi shouted, you moron, you realize this is insubordination. Naruto shouted back, this time at the bubble, you said it yourself, sensei. A shinobi who abandons his mission is no shinobi at all, and a shinobi who abandons his comrades is scum. To solidify his point, Naruto pulled off his headband and threw it at Zabuza, who caught it with his free hand. Kakashi quivered. Shit, what's he thinking? Naruto then summoned a slew of shadow clones, prompting Zabuza to summon a single water clone, handing it his sword. Each Naruto ran towards the Zabuza clone, but were all destroyed with a swift swing of the sword, clouding the battlefield with smoke. As the smoke cleared, Zabuza found himself perplexed. A kid that age knows shadow clones. Besides that, where the hell is he? His intuition told him to look behind, and as he did, he saw Naruto in midair having thrown multiple shuriken at him. Zabuza was about to bring up his free hand to block the shuriken with a technique, but found that the arm was being pulled down. Instinctively, he brought up the hand maintaining the water prison, using it to create a water wall to block the shuriken, inadvertently freeing Kakashi. Naruto fell into the water, as his team looked on in astonishment. Sakura, in particular, was floored. Did Naruto really do all that? What's this feeling? Kakashi beamed with pride. Within a few seconds, he came up with a crazy plan like that to free me. He really is his parent's son. Kakashi slid back on the water, creating space between himself and Zabuza, who did the same. As Zabuza slid back, he found that the culprit of his free hand's lack of mobility was a shadow clone Naruto had made, which managed to hide until it found the opportunity to grab him. What kind of freak kid thinks that fast? Damn it! Zabuza's water clone threw the sword back at him and dispelled, as Zabuza himself destroyed Naruto's clone and sheathed it on his back. Naruto sat up in the water, watching the battle ensue. Ijjj just wish it wasn't SSS so sea cold. Zabuza began forming a long string of hand signs, chanting their names, as Kakashi sprung to mirror him. After dozens of signs were completed, both men summoned dragons from the water. These dragons twisted and turned around each other, before colliding in an immense splash that rained down on them and Naruto. Fortunately for Kakashi, the force of the dragons knocked Zabuza down, giving him ample time to grab Naruto and push him towards the rest of the group, while he himself fought with Zabuza. Stumbling. Naruto managed to pick up his headband. As Naruto stood upright, 
He nearly bumped into Sasuke, but was saved again by Sakura, who knocked him down and fell again. When Naruto looked back up, he saw that Sasuke had been struck by multiple needs in his chest. Scrambling, Naruto shoved Sakura off, dropped his headband, and yanked Tizuna's leg to make him fall back on the dirt to help keep him safe from any more needles. Naruto scanned the trees and spotted a second shadowy figure. Before he could chase the figure, Naruto had Sasuke croak, Naruto. Find the man who killed my family. Naruto panicked. No, 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 he can't be dead. He's just delirious, isn't he? He opted to pursue the shadowy figure he saw, and the figure seemed to be content with confronting him, as it descended onto the ground in front of Naruto. However, before they could battle, Zabuza shouted, Haku, retreat. With that, the figure jumped back into the trees and vanished, while Zabuza did the same with the mist. In the blink of an eye, the fog around the area cleared the blue sky was vibrant, and the sun was getting close to the horizon. Naruto watched as Kakashi, battered and exhausted, limped over to him. He ran towards Kakashi, then held his hand to help guide him towards the group. It was then that the initial shock of everything wore off, and Naruto remembered what had just happened. He pulled Kakashi harder to reach Sasuke, who was still lying on the ground. Sakura was holding him and crying, begging, just wake up, Sasuke, please. Tizuna watched, standing still. Damn. Kakashi let go of Naruto's hand, silently giving him permission to go to Sasuke. Naruto skipped over and kneeled, checking for a pulse. He's cold. And I'm not feeling any. Sasuke suddenly spoke, unhand me, through squinted eyes. Through teary eyes, Naruto obliged him, dropping his arm onto the ground. He got up and wiped his tears, blubbering, let's just get to this drunkard's house already. By the end of the sunset, Team 7 and Tizuna reached their destination. They had walked through a wooded area and up to the porch of a house just outside the outskirts of town. The door opened, and greeting them was a young black-haired woman, along with a little boy hiding behind her leg. Tizuna greeted, Evening, Tsunami. The woman reciprocated, Good evening, Tizuna. She looked at the team, seeing Kakashi and Sasuke battered, held up by Naruto and Sakura, and asked, This is your security? The old man chuckled. Two of them are sick. They don't look like much, but they're honest. Naruto pouted. What do you mean, not much, didn't I just? Sakura nudged him with her elbow. She gave him a glare that told him to keep quiet, and he figured it was on account of not scaring the boy. So, Naruto continued, I just picked up a bag that you dropped, and that you would have forgotten. Tsunami opened the door to let everyone in, as Kakashi commanded, Don't bother making dinner for me or my raven haired fellow, we're going to sleep, he's already ahead of me on that. A few hours later, after having showered, Naruto, Sakura, Tizuna, Tsunami, and Tsunami's son sat at the dining room table. Sasuke and Kakashi had been moved into a small guest room to rest. Dinner tonight was rice with meatballs. Tsunami stated, I should apologize, I usually whip up something fancier. Sakura was quick to reply, don't be. This is good food, right, Naruto? She nudged the blonde next to her, whose eyes suddenly went wide. His mouth was full of food, so he tried his best to swallow quickly and affirm the sentiment. As soon as he did, he said, oh, yeah. My guardian Anko taught me to cook but even I can't do it this good. This one time I tried to make rice and meatballs, but I boiled the meatballs and roasted the rice. The group laughed, forgetting their troubles for a while. After dinner, Tsunami offered and proceeded to take the plates and clean them up. Tizuna rose and left for the living room, leaving Naruto and Sakura alone with Tsunami's son, who sat across the table. Naruto asked, So, what's your name, kid? The child answered, My name is Inari Aono. I'm ten years old. I'm, I don't like you. Inari sped out his chair and ran upstairs. Naruto and Sakura stared at each other. That was weird. They simultaneously rose from their chairs, and Naruto followed Sakura into the living room. They saw Tizuna sitting on the couch watching TV, and he told them, By the way, kiddos, I told Tsunami or the phone to set up the guest room for ya. So if ye don't like the local TV, you can watch some movies. Sakura bowed, thanks, Tizuna and led Naruto upstairs. Upon finding the guest room assigned to them, Naruto was amazed at how spacious it was, as was Sakura. This is even bigger than my room. There's even a couch and a coffee table in here. 
The genin plopped onto the couch at the foot of the bed, primed and ready to watch the massive TV, whose speakers were booming. They flipped through the channels. Soap opera. Soap opera. Soap. Opera. Boring movie. Boring documentary. Terrible cartoon. Terrible sitcom. Infomercial. Static. Static. What a terrible day to watch TV. Naruto tugged on Sakura's sleeve. There's nothing to watch. Sakura rolled her eyes. I know. But it looks like Tsunami left some movies for us in the shelf next to the TV. She stood up and walked to the shelf again, with Naruto following and looked at the available films. The notebook? She adorned a devilish smile as she decided, we'll watch this. Naruto protested, what? Come on, it looks like sappy garbage. Sakura argued, well, I don't see you picking out a film. Naruto groaned as he conducted his own search, Terminator 2, extended cut. Naruto flaunted the movie. I want to watch this, Sakura grumbled. Fine, but only after we watch my movie, two hours later. Sakura was bawling her eyes out, blowing her nose into a tissue. It's just so beautiful, Naruto wasn't impressed. If I ever find myself acting like that guy, I'm gonna jump off a cliff onto a bed of nails. Sakura scoffed, wiping her tears. Whatever. Let's just watch your preferred nonsense. With pleasure. Two and a half hours later Naruto and Sakura were both bawling their eyes out. Sakura handed Naruto a tissue, and both of them blew their noses. It's so beautiful. Sakura cried, I, I didn't expect it to be so touching. Naruto added, me neither. Near midnight Naruto and Sakura were lying in bed, though the two of them were on complete opposite ends of the bed, with no physical contact a demand made by Sakura. Though both were wearing their pajamas and donning the large fur blanket provided for them, and though the windows were closed and the heat in the house was running, it was astonishingly cold. Though Sakura put on a front, lest she embarrass herself, Naruto was openly shuddering the absence of a healthy amount of fat on his body was undoubtedly working to his detriment. It was made even worse when Sakura, approaching the sleep state, yanked the blanket off of him to hog it for herself. The dilemma presented to Naruto now was whether he should tell her about it, and risk a scolding, or silently suffer in the perceived sub-zero temperatures of the land of waves. He opted for the latter. No point pissing her off, right? Thus, the boy resolved himself to the cold. He curled up, rubbing the sides of his chest, shaking on and on. He could feel wind entering through every open space in his outfit, circulating throughout his body, and leaving only to be replaced by an even colder wind. I. I can't bear this any longer, he swallowed his fear, and bounced to roll over. He hadn't expected that he'd be face to face with a very stern looking Sakura. He sheepishly chuckled. So, guess you're awake? She sighed, and replied, yeah. Obviously. I turned around a while ago and noticed that I'd pulled the blanket off of you. Sorry. Naruto insisted, what no, there's no need to be sorry. Just gimme my side of the blanket. Not that I'd do anything bad if you didn't. I, I mean. Quit overthinking it, dweeb. Why yeah, sure. After the blanket had been returned to Naruto, he asked, so. You said you'd turned around a while ago. Why didn't you return the blanket then? Sakura's cheeks flushed as she answered, I think I kind of wanted to see if you would say anything. I was going to give it back regardless. Oh. Well, I did good turnin' around, then, didn't I? Yeah, I like people who address their problems like that. Now, Naruto's cheeks went red. Oh, so you, like me? We've been over this already. You don't piss me off, and I don't crush your skull. Okay. Maybe I could have said something nicer than that. Naruto pouted. Darn. Sakura changed the subject. Anyways, it's really cold tonight. I was thinking that maybe, possibly, it wouldn't be inappropriate for us to share our body heat. Naruto stammered. Oh, ah yeah, sure. I fell asleep on the boat cause of that, didn't I? Sakura giggled. Yeah, you did. She inched closer to the middle of the bed, where Naruto had found himself after his dramatic turnaround. She cleared her throat. Remember, we're never to speak of this to anyone else, unless I say so. Naruto nodded. Yeah, sure, the usual deal. Sakura then brought her arm around Naruto's shoulder under the bed, as she brought the other one under his other arm. She then guided him to a mirrored position. Hesitantly, she pulled him in close eliciting a small, eep, from him, making both their cheeks somehow redder and took a deep breath. However, 
her hopes of getting to sleep soon were crushed by the jackhammering of Naruto's chest against hers. She whispered, Hey, calm down. I'm trying to sleep. Naruto, drowning in embarrassment, squeaked, I I dunno how. Sakura ordered, Take some deep breaths, and don't speak a word of this. While Naruto did as he was told, Sakura made an observation about his posture. This kid's whole body is stiff as a board. Why does he still have his guard up? She subtly verbalized her concerns, whispering, Naruto, calming down includes the act of not freezing up like a clam. Not understanding the metaphor, Naruto replied, How can I not be frozen up? It's like a negative billion degrees here. Sakura let out a hefty sigh. This is going to take a while. She expanded, I mean, it doesn't seem to me like you're relaxed, at all. I don't get it. Oh my god, just go, boneless. Sakura felt Naruto's realization, as he jerked unexpectedly. He let out a short strained groan, before going completely limp. He squealed, I'm at your mercy, Sakura. Sakura giggled, warming the boy's heart. Naruto felt the tiredness of the day coming over him. Man, the shit I've been through. How come it takes all that to get me this tired? Just then, Sakura inadvertently delivered the killing blow. She further closed the gap between her body and his, while bringing her leg around his to lock them into place. Sakura then took the liberty of catalyzing Naruto's descent by lightly rubbing his back with an open palm. This led to the consequence of Naruto, his mind gone completely blank now, sinking deeper into Sakura's shoulder, giving her mixed feelings. Well, I'd be lying if I said this wasn't comfortable. Naruto on the other hand, felt something much simpler. Man, I really needed this. Sakura is a godsend. For the first time in a long time, Naruto had a fruitful sleep. When Sakura woke up, her vision was blurred, red sunlight was pouring through the window, and she felt a warm figure that she was grasping onto. In her blind comfort, she nuzzled into the large bag, squeezing it tighter. What a nice, warm bag. Wait a minute. Since when do I sleep with a bag? She rubbed out some eye crust with her thumb's knuckle as she began to remember what had transpired the night before. Right. Not a warm bag, a warm person. Sakura diverted her attention to the wall, analyzing the clock. 6.30 a.m. Thank God, I don't need to be out of bed for a while. She brought her gaze back to the boy in her arms. She stared at Naruto for a while, admiring his soft features. She noticed that his hair had been growing longer, as he hadn't had it cut in a while, and that it was approaching the awkward phase. He may be annoying, but I'd be lying if I said he wasn't kind of adorable. Something about him being so vulnerable just speaks to me. Sakura brought up her hand to gently whisk away a lock of hair that had made its way into Naruto's forehead. However, when she actually moved the hair, he jolted awake. Sakura was just as shocked as Naruto, who was siren eyed for a few seconds before realizing where he was. Sleeping. Hugging Sakura. This one's going in the memory banks. He asked, S. Sakura. What time is it? The girl responded, just go back to sleep, Naruto. It's 6.30. We don't need to be up for a few hours. She shuffled back into her former position, ready to go back to sleep. Unfortunately for her, Naruto had other ideas. He squirmed around and rolled over, such that his back was now facing Sakura. Without a word, he shuffled backwards and grabbed Sakura's arm, guiding it around his waist like a seatbelt and then hugging it, before promptly dozing off. Sakura was dumbfounded. Idiot. I didn't say you could do that. Later, in the morning as Naruto and Sakura, having completed their morning ablutions, put on their day clothes, Sakura took the opportunity to ask, Hey, Naruto, do you remember how I accidentally woke you up earlier? Naruto was perplexed. He replied, No. I slept all the way through since last night, didn't I? Sakura answered, No, you didn't never mind, it's not important. Naruto continuously tugged her arm and pestered, Come on tell me. She snapped, I said it's not important, okay. Just stop being stupid. Naruto grumbled, oh, fine. I'll just go and bother someone else, then, and stormed off into the hallway. Running in tow, Sakura shouted, Naruto, wait. Darn it. Why's he gotta be so hot-headed? As Sakura burst into the other guest room, she bumped right into Naruto, who had been standing still. Though she initially intended to chastise him for this, she decided against it when she noticed his sudden change in demeanor. 
In response to having been bumped into, Naruto had politely stepped aside, staring at his feet as if in shame, quietly asking, Oh oh, Sakura. Sorry. You alright? Wanting to lighten the mood, Sakura gently pushed on Naruto's forehead with her finger, guiding him to stare at her directly. She questioned, as she poked him, Why were you standing here like that anyways? Effectively under a spell, Naruto answered, I, I was gonna talk to Kakashi Sensei, but he's asleep. Just then, a voice from side announced, I'm wide awake. The genin turned their attention to the voice, finding that Kakashi had risen into a seated position in the mattress he was provided. He beckoned, come here, and wake up Sasuke, he needs to hear this, too. Sakura shied away from the latter task, gently pushing Naruto to the other mattress. Naruto's first instinct was to wake Sasuke up with a violent act of some sort. Maybe an elbow drop? Nah, I shouldn't annoy him like that especially when he's all bedridden. Wimp. Instead, Naruto kneeled, placing one hand on Sasuke's shoulder, and the other on the far side of his chest. He shook the boy with haste, demanding, Wake up, gay boy, sensei wants to say something. Sasuke was audibly frustrated, as he growled a bit before opening his eyes and turning to Naruto. He responded, There's only one fag in this room, and he's got blonde hair. Yeah, well, Kakashi bellowed, enough. I need to speak to all of you. The joys muttered, but obeyed as Kakashi explained, that man we fought yesterday. His name is Zabuza Momochi. He's an A-class rogue ninja, born in the Hidden Mist. He. He murdered every single one of his classmates before he abandoned his village. The genin shuddered. We really lucked out, didn't we? Kakashi added, Team, I want you to take heed of what I'm about to say. The genin concentrated their attention on the man, as he continued speaking. His face turned cold and stern. What Naruto did yesterday directly disobeying my orders was at best insubordination, and at worst grounds for suspension from shinobi activity. If I ever, and I mean ever, give an order like that again, just leave me and obey. Naruto protested, but you're the one who told us the team matters more than the mission. Kakashi argued, it was a damned foolish thing to say, it could have gotten you killed. But no one died, enough, Naruto. I won't let you nor Sasuke, nor Sakura, sacrifice yourselves for me. Oh oh yeah. Well, if we did run, we would have gotten caught by that other guy that showed up, and we really would have died, then. Did you know he'd show up? What's that matter? Based on the knowledge that you had, it was a suicide mission to try to free me. Naruto's voice began to crack. I didn't just try, though, did I? I got it done. Kakashi remained adamant, in defiance of a direct order. The tears were spilling. Damn your orders, they don't mean shit to me. I'd rather die than follow anyone blindly. Naruto stormed out of the house, skipping breakfast, running straight into the deep forest. Throwing respect to the wind, Sakura growled, What the hell, sensei? You know Naruto's sensitive. Kakashi laid back down, answering, It's a test of his resolve. I need to know if he'll stick to his principles, even if he's ordered to betray them. Sakura hissed, some test this is, you're just hurting his feelings. Yes, his feelings have been hurt, and his pride is wounded. But he stood his ground and refused to relent. The greatest test of one's principles is when those principles are challenged by authority whether it's society, or a superior like me. Kakashi then changed the subject. Now, Sakura, you have some work to do. I do. When you're done with breakfast, put on your coat and go to the bazaar, Buy Naruto something he'll like he'll surely be back by sundown, then keep watch over the bridge until the workers leave or until I tell you to whichever comes first. Sakura obeyed, albeit letting out a small, HMPH, to show her disapproval of her sensei's behavior. I hope Naruto's alright. A few minutes later being sure that Sakura was gone, Sasuke decided to rip off the bandage of a certain conversation with Kakashi. He openly asked, Sensei, are you the one who murdered my family? Kakashi numbly asked, What possesses you to ask me that? Sasuke told him, You have a Sharingan eye. The man who killed my family has the Sharingan, too. Kakashi questioned, But wasn't your own testimony the definitive piece of evidence that revealed your own brother was the killer? Sasuke answered, Yes, but, it still doesn't make sense. Tears began to spill. My own damn brother, murdering everyone I love? That's insane. I know it's true in my heart but I'd rather accept anyone else, anyone but him. 
Kakashi stayed silent. In the town even through the heavy coat that she had donned, Sakura felt the harsh wind of the land of waves beating against her body. Luckily, she found the bazaar with ease, as it was the most populated area in the land of waves, with a small crowd all the way through. She hopped into a general store, wondering if Naruto would like some sort of trinket. There's barely anything here. The general store was little more than a counter, four shelves, and local decorations including a firearm on the wall, bells hanging on the shelves, and a porcelain fish. Sakura spotted a necklace out the corner of her eye, and made a beeline towards it. It was a bright, faux, hexagonal sapphire, with a simple black thread keeping it in place. Would Naruto really like this, though? Besides, couldn't I always just as easily get the real thing in the hidden leaf? She opted to approach the counter instead. She asked the clerk, a very lanky old man, excuse me, could you please help me find something to buy as a gift? The man croaked, of course. For whom, may I ask? Sakura answered, it's a boy, I don't like him or anything, but that's beside the point. The man pressed, well, tell me about him. I might come up with something. The girl told him, well, he's kinda hyper. He's impulsive, brash, and sometimes irresponsible. But he's also kinda smart in his own right and he can be deceptively sweet. Uh huh. I don't like him. The old man nodded. He suggested, you were eyeing the sapphire earlier. A girl like you must know it's fake, but isn't it the thought that counts? Sakura questioned, hey, what do you mean by, a girl like me? The man replied, with all due respect, you stick out like a sore thumb here. Anyone and their dying blind mother could tell you're from somewhere better off. Sakura sheepishly responded, Well, I'll just buy the necklace and get out of your hair. After stepping out of the store, Sakura began to make her way to the bridge, taking note of the people around her. Everyone else is wearing simple, clean clothes that fit. Aren't I doing the same? Though I guess Kashmir isn't the norm here. Not that it's everywhere in the hidden leaf, either. As she was lost in her thoughts, Sakura suddenly felt a hand groping her bottom. Her first instinct was to turn around and lambast the assailant. Hey, what do you think you're oh? The supposed groper was actually a much smaller boy, disheveled and pleading, begging for change. I can't just ignore a little kid, but isn't this a pretty common scam around these parts? Guardians sending their kids to pretend they're poor and squeeze money out of unsuspecting pedestrians. Just then, Sakura was poked on the shoulder by a girl only a few years older than her. The older girl told her, Hey, you should watch out for this one he and his mother scammed 50 Rio out of some underdist, orange-clad blondie. Wait, what? It's crazy, I know. I asked the guy about it and he just said, That's alright, at least it means he isn't actually sick and poor. Kids got no sense of fiscal responsibility. Sakura thanked the girl for the warning, and each child parted ways. Underdist, orange clad blondie. Come to think of it, Naruto was just wearing his normal vest when he ran out. And wasn't 50 Ryo the exact amount of money he got as a bonus from the Hokage? I can't believe he just gave it away like that. Sakura imagined the sight of Naruto taking all that money out of his frog wallet, and a warm smile overtook her face. Well, off to the bridge. Can't wait for them to finish for today. In the forest, Naruto dragged his feet through the woods as he cried. I'm so stupid. Stupid stupid stupid. I could just die. It's so cold, I just might. As he encountered a clearing in the forest, he felt the presence of another person nearby. After pushing aside some shrubs, he noticed a young woman bent over next to a basket, picking plants in a wide, open plain. All she's wearing is sandals and a summer robe, with no sleeves. Is she crazy? Then again, I don't think I'm any better. But how should I have known it was gonna get this cold here? Not wanting to come across as impolite, Naruto approached the girl. He asked, Hey, miss, can I help ya? The girl turned around, and quickly hid the shocked expression upon seeing Naruto. She answered, in a voice as feminine as could be, I'm a boy. Naruto's eye twitched. That's a guy? He's even girlier than Sakura, is he, gay? The boy announced, and no, I'm not gay. I'm straight as an arrow. Naruto blushed. He cleared his throat and asked again, W whatever, can I help you, sir? The mysterious boy replied, I think, sir, is too formal. Just call me Haku it is my name, after all. Having calmed down a bit, Naruto squatted next to Haku, inquiring, Alright, Haku. What are you looking for? 
Haku told him, Yaro. It's a plant used for medicine, though too much can make you sick. Look for a flower that's white or pinkish, and put them in the basket. Naruto responded, All right, Yaro, as he kneeled to search for and pick the plants. Yaro. Yaro. Yaro? Why's it called, yellow, if it's pink? Haku broke the silence with, I know, it's funny that it sounds like, yellow, when it's white or pink. Naruto pouted. Is this guy read in my mind? Is that a gay power or something? Haku added, and no, I'm not reading your mind. I'm just good at guessing what people are like, and in turn, what they're thinking. Naruto dismissively countered, yeah, I figured. If you could read my mind, you would have also had to tell me that it's not a gay power. Haku scoffed. I'm not gay, Naruto. The blonde argued, I bet you've got mags of naked guys under your bed. Haku shot back, I sleep on the floor. Naruto retorted, then you're probably hiding them in the gay guy's secret compartment. Oh, yeah. Well, you, uh. Darn it, I can't think of anything. Too busy having gay thoughts? No, violent thoughts. Violently homosexual. Haku stifled his laughter. You just pick up the plants, man. Both boys shared hearty laughter, as they placed a few more yarrow into the basket. Haku cleared his throat and stated, All right. I think this is more than enough take a handful, I think you could use some. As Naruto obliged, Haku rose. He was handed the basket by Naruto, who asked, Hold on, who do you need the Yaro for? The older boy answered, Someone I care about deeply. Huh. All right then, bye bye. Bye, Naruto. Naruto watched as Haku went his way. I never told him my name, but he said it to me twice. And how does he know I've got someone sick to take care of? I should have put a flying thunder mark on him, but where? And how would I cover up the bleeding hand? Maybe it's better that I didn't try anything. Naruto's blood silently boiled. I have the resources to blow this thing wide open, but I'm just too weak for it. God, help me. Naruto's thoughts conflicted as his eyes went to the Yaro. Don't really care for the bastard, but maybe Sasuke could use some of this. Dot 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 noon on the bridge the bridge under construction was three quarters of the way done on both ends one wide long gap was left to build and bridging it was the last task that needed to be accomplished it would have been done sooner if tizuna who was supervising wasn't having some labor issues a nervous man in his 30s approached tizuna hey mr aono i was thinking it was just about time for a break tizuna replied so, I'm no tyrant, you know you're free to go. The man responded, Mr. Aono, I meant, break, as in. I know, what you mean. Just go. The younger man bowed, said, I'm sorry, Tizuna, and scurried off. Sakura asked her client, Tizuna, what was that? He answered, these men, they have families to feed, and my money isn't put in food on the table fast enough. So, they leave. I've lost track of how many times it's happened. Noting that Tizuna was digging into his palms with his knuckles, Sakura further questioned, Hey are you okay, Tizuna? He told her, Oh, course not. I just wish me men would have a modicum of faith in myself. Kills me to see them given up. Sakura soaked his words in. What has this place gone through? The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.